Good evening. The uh, Northampton School Committee is now reconvening an open session after having uh, been in an executive session. Uh, and we will now move into our regular agenda, which is the begins with the public comment period. Um, I would ask uh, those who wish to speak in public comment if you could just state your name and address for the record. And uh, I will keep the time at three minutes. Um, I'm just grabbing the list. So the first uh, person who is signed up to speak is Dr. K. Sakvitny. Hello, I'm Dr. K. Sakvitny, uh, 9 Bayberry Lane in Florence. I'm a clinical psychologist and the parent of two high school students. And many of you have heard me before, so I could just stand here for three minutes and you'd know a lot of what I'm going to say. But instead, I'll try to make it brief. <laughs> um, I have in the past, um, when I've talked about the issue of school start time, I have um, presented and given information about the research findings. What I really want to say, I can summarize that in a sentence. The research findings are compelling. As a psychologist, I am persuaded that the findings are so strong that they should guide our decision. Sleep plays a key role in learning, achievement, health, mood, and safety. The major thing that has held us back, I understand there isn't disagreement about that. When these discussions have happened, there is not disagreement about the fact that it is better for high school students to have a later start time in Northampton. The dilemmas have come up about around the logistics. 25 to 30 years ago, the town made a decision to go with a three-tiered bus schedule for budgetary, not educational reasons. Uh, but we're now in a position to know about the negative costs of that decision and to correct the inadvertent harm to adolescent brains, bodies, mood, and learning that result from that schedule. I believe it's the job of the superintendent of the school committee to lead educational decisions based on current knowledge about children's physiology and learning process. I'm also a member of the SPED PAC, the Special Education Parents Advisory Committee. I attended Lori Farkas's summary of the SPED budget for next year. She did a wonderful job going over it in great detail. And while you all know I completely support the override, I will be voting for the override, but I want to point out that even with, even were the override not to pass, we still are in a position to do something to improve the circumstances of all students by moving decisively and swiftly on the proposal that's going to be presented later um, this evening. And I want to urge that that's what happens. The very last point I want to make is also one I've made before, but is that Less sleep is handicaps all students, but it disproportionately burdens students with learning differences. And I want that to be taken seriously and considered that those students need the sleep and the um, help to education that sleep gives as much or more as all students. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next uh, speaker who signed up is Gina Whalen. I live at 35 Norfolk Avenue. Um, I am a sophomore at Northampton High School. My first period class, um, half the students struggled to stay awake. On occasion, our first period class meets later in the day, and on those days, the teacher has remarked a significant increase in attention and participation of the students. I think starting later would be very beneficial. It would just take the edge off the exhaustion. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. The next speaker is Deb Kuhn. Hello, my name is Deb Kuhn. I live at 19 Drusen Drive in Florence. Um, I'm here this evening to speak a bit about the future of art, specifically music, at Northampton High School if the current cuts come to fruition. This is the third time in my history with the Northampton Public Schools that I have stood here in support of music. I would also like to add that I've been teaching at the high school since 2002. Prior to my arrival, I do not believe that any band director had lasted more than four to five years since the days of Noreen Tiley. 
I have given each of you a packet of materials that I hope you will find the time to read. It begins with a letter I wrote to the editor in 2006 when we made the decision to cut instrumental music from the curriculum for fourth and fifth graders. I consider this to be very important because it illustrates so clearly that cuts in the arts program seldom heal. With each loss or change of personnel, the program needs to begin anew. And if the program is gone, it is especially hard to rekindle. As it stands now, the instrumental music position for the next year allows for a teacher at 34%. This will cover the cost of a band director and nothing more. There will be no music theory, no jazz program, no history of popular music, and very likely no student orchestra for the musical. There certainly will be no chamber music class, a class that was lost when my job was cut to 83%. Students will not have regular access to a music teacher after school or at other times during the school day. Students who desire a career in music will find it difficult to get the direction and encouragement that they need. Just as troubling is the loss of a class for musicians that don't fit into a band setting. What will become of our guitar players, bass players, and our pianists, and those who play drum kit? For these kids, there are no strong advocates. Bill, the custodian, please call the pool office. Bill, the custodian, please call the pool office. There are few adults who will stand up and fight to maintain these classes. Many, although not all, of these students are at risk. A music program is just that. It is a program. It is more than a class. It is a culture. It is a place of connection, a place to connect with your peers, your teacher, the music, and a tradition. When done well, students experience high quality music and play at a high level. And I believe we have achieved this at Northampton High School. With a band director at 34 or 50 or perhaps even 67 percent, the sense of program will likely not exist. Certainly at 34 percent, you're inviting a revolving door of teachers. There will be no consistency and no continuity. The research is overwhelming about the positive impact of music and the other arts on student learning. I believe it is time to stand up and find some creative solutions. You must understand that these cuts will gut the program and rob our children of the kind of education that they deserve. Please go back to the drawing board and try again. It is impossible to convey in this short time the impact that the current plan will have on our students and the culture at the high school. What I do know for sure is that it will take years to build the program back up to its current quality. Again, I hope you can find a moment to read the materials I have given you. They are just a drop in the ocean of research that, that is out there. And I would also like to invite you to our spring concert on May 16th at 7 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker is Daniel Dietz. One, okay. Hello, my name is Daniel Dietz and I live on 222 Elm Street. I graduated from Northampton High School last year and I just finished up my freshman year at the University of Massachusetts, studying at the Eisenberg School of Management and being a part of the Commonwealth Honors College. I'm here tonight to urge the school committee to move to address the issue of the school start time. I was a part of the committee last year as the student representative, and over and over again, I heard about the issues about changing the school start time and the stats how it was better for the student's mind and for their learning. But I'm not here to talk about the statistics tonight. I'm here to talk about my own experience with my younger brother. My younger brother, Zachary, just started this year at the high school, and I am proud to say He's absolutely doing an amazing job with a 4.0 GPA and honors classes that are a year older than him. But the one problem is, Zach's having a hard time waking up at eight morning. And because of that, I found it's, he's really depressed and he seems to be moody a lot more than usual. So I, I feel that it's because of the school start time and it's just taking a big, big drain on his body. And it saddens me to know that he's not having the same type of experience that I had. But looking back, I too struggled with the school start time and feel that other students did too. We're just a sweep for half of it, so we don't really remember. <laughs> so in college, I enjoyed it so much more, being able to sweep in, being able to enjoy my classes because I was sweep, I mean awake for most of them and not sweep. And I feel like I just was more involved in my education. And I think that it's a really, it's a good thing to try to uh, look at changing. And I urge you guys to look at it and to try to make a decision that's best for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Next speaker, Renee Wetstein. 
Hello, I'm Renee Westin, 222 Elm Street. I live with the Deets Boys. And um, it seems to me that the school start time has really polarized this community. And, um, you know, issues like this, is, it's kind of strange why it's so polarizing. It, it just reminds me of the assault, you know, the ban on assault weapons. You know, it seems, to, if you believe in the assault, but, you know, the ban on assault weapons, you, you, it's a no-brainer to you. You're thinking, like, how many more kids need to die? You know, even a... a um, Representative, you know, keeps you know, Gabby keeps on you know coming back, and it seems like they can't get a ban. And it seems like the same thing with the school start time. There are people that are so convinced that it's the right thing to do. The statistics, I think, most of the committee, but I don't think all of the committee, really, really, truly, in their gut, wants to change it because I think it would have happened. So why, why is this so polarizing? And I think it has to do with it's not as simple as if a kid was allergic to peanut butter. If a kid was truly allergic to peanut butter and they were, you know, gagging sick, had to be hospitalized, you would say, you know, don't give the kid peanut butter and you wouldn't have your child be eating peanut butter sandwich next to that child. I think the school start time, it's something that's not credible. You know, you think like the kids need, should go to bed earlier. I've heard that, you know, different speeches that the kids are up late doing, you know, Facebook or texting. Well, I could tell you the experience of the kids that I know from raising kids, being involved with other kids, being involved with the Key Club. I mean, the, most students have to get up between 6 and 6.30. They go to school. They end at 1.59. A lot of them go to after school help. And you know why they need after school help? Because they're asleep during a lot of their lessons. It's so much information that they have to access and they're not fully engaged because they're exhausted. Um, one of my kids has a newspaper rolled up by his teacher and hits him in the head during his, because he falls asleep. So, you know, you hear stories like this over and over again. There are students that are falling asleep in class. And so, of course, they need extra help because they're not accessing it. And then they have sports, typically at 3 o'clock. The practices are two hours, and a lot of them are not at the high school. It's at JFK or Ryan Road. The time they get back home um, is close to 5.30. And then a lot of them have after school, whether it's Key Club at Mondays at 7 o'clock, whether it's the play, whether it's musicals. It's a very long day for these kids, and they are going to bed at some point. But it's a very long day. And so I ask that you look at this as compassion, that, that you know, whether it's, a, whether it's your kid didn't get affected by it, whether, you know, we've had people come up and say, well, my kid is on such and such team and it's working for, for my child. But what about so many kids that it's not working for? And so that's what I'm asking for, compassion, to really think about so many students it's really not working for. And it's not working for, my, for two of my three kids and it isn't working for a lot of their friends. So, you know, if they're depressed, if they're sad, if they're not engaged, it doesn't have to be this experience. My understanding is that the committee is going to come to you tonight with the proposal, they looked at all the logistics. So I hope tonight you vote on it because it's May and we need to know in September that this change is being made. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Zachary Dietz. This is the 222 Elm Street portion of the agenda. <laughs> uh, Zachary Dietz, 222 Elm Street. Um, I'm the talked about Zachary. Uh, I didn't know that was going to happen, but uh, I guess it did. So, um, I, recently in my in my writing class, I wrote uh, a report on school start time because we we were asked to write a paper on a problem in our community um, and write a solution to the problem and like lay out what the problem is and what you think the solution should be. So I chose school start time. Um, and I sent that paper actually to all of you. I'm not sure if you, any of you got the chance to look at it yet. Um, so basically what I, I did a lot of research in writing this paper and I found out a lot of things I didn't know before, but the key thing that really stood out was that every kid is different. And so all, there's a lot of studies that just say blanket facts, but that's not gonna be true for every kid. But what I did realize is that in general for for a school system you need to you need to target you need to have the school set up so that um, you're targeting the average kid because not every kid is going to be the same so like I ha I know I think one kid who thinks the school start time is great and should actually be earlier that's one kid I know and then I know a lot a lot of kids who think it should be uh, later. Um, 
I've not had a class this year where I've not seen kids fall asleep. Today, I saw a kid fall out, out of his chair because he was so deep in asleep. He like slid and, and fell. Um, and yeah, it's just really, it's really frustrating trying to learn. And it's also really, really hard to learn uh, Honors Algebra 2 at 7.30 in the morning. Um, I almost fell asleep during a test yesterday that I had, which wasn't a good sign, I don't think. Um, yeah, uh, looks like I have enough time. I'm going to read <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing that I think is important that has never really been discussed in the, in, uh, to the committee. So um, REM sleep is rapid eye mo movement sleep, and it pre predominates throughout the final two to three hours of the night. So um, this type of sleep is essential for learning, and it's towards the end of your sleep. And since high school students are being woken up um, before their natural like rise time, they're missing out on this sleep, and that makes it really hard for us to remember stuff throughout the day. And that was just a cool fact I hadn't heard stated before. Um, and there's some really cool stuff about uh, ADHD being talked about, being it being misdiagnosed as a, it sh it's actually a sleep disorder you, most of the time. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Zachary. The next speaker is Stephen Eldridge. Hello, I'm uh, Stephen Eldridge. I live at 20 Nonatex Street in Florence. I'm the theater teacher at Northampton High School. I, first of all, just want to thank Deb Kuhn. Um, I think she has uh, articulated extremely well and briefly and cogently um, the issues that are facing music. And I would say, and I would agree with Deb, that we, each of the, uh, I'm the, did I mention I'm the theater teacher? Yeah that each of the arts teachers at the high school are, are facing an array of such issues, each in our own way. Um, I'm also very pleased that Deb spoke about culture, saving me having to establish that as an issue. Um, one of the interesting things that affects us as art teachers is that the work begins in the classroom. It begins completely curricular, but where the work goes when it goes into art, and this I think is true of every single one of us, is it then has to go, it grows outside of the classroom. It, it goes into performances and art exhibits. It goes out into the community. Um, and so that sort of extends the arc of what we do with the students. So when we talk about establishing a culture and, and, and building a culture um, that can support that kind of work, um, it, it's a very concrete issue. For example, one of the reasons that Bo Flahive can't be here tonight is that she's got a concert. So her students from the classroom are with her performing. Um, in my case, where the issue is going to affect me the most clearly is with the student production program. Uh, we do full-length productions that are entirely produced, directed, choreographed, composed, painted, designed, acted, you name it, by students. Um, and this wasn't my original intention as a teacher. This is my eighth year in the, in the program in the high school. Um, I started a one-act festival. I felt that was important because I wanted every kid in the school to be able to act each year. And I wanted there to be a concrete um, final at the end of the fall semester for all of the acting students in the mode of the winter and spring concerts. I actually borrowed that idea from the music department. And the students um, picked up on that idea. And I have been watching the culture of theater production, of students forming teams to collaborate using higher orders of thinking, to interpret literature. Very, very often, the latest production we did was, of course, Alice in Wonderland. So they're very often adapting works of literature. I probably shouldn't even mention Clockwork Orange. Um, which was a production that featured original music, choreography, video, fine art by the students. Now the problem is, is that this, I as an educator and an artist am extremely excited by the students developing this and I am 
as my curriculum goes, I'm trying to incorporate them into curriculum, and I hear my time is ending. So all I can say is uh, there's no way to discuss this in the three-minute format. Those of you who would like to talk to some of us, tomorrow from 4 to 7 p.m., there will be an art and, uh, and technology education exhibit at Forbes Library, and there will be a reception from 4 to 7. And um, good luck. Thank you, Mr. Eldridge. Uh, that completes the list of folks who signed up. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? <clears throat> okay, if you could just state your name and address. Good evening. My name is Jennifer McKenna. I live at 89 Florence Street in Leeds. Um, I actually want to just speak briefly to both issues that have been addressed tonight now and echo what's been said um, uh, about the theater department uh, and the music department at Northampton High School which are extraordinary. Um, personally, my son has found himself in those two places. Um, I learned today that the NHS administration has taken all the kids who signed up for music theory, jazz workshop, the history of popular music next year, and put them into other electives. This does not <coughs> telegraph or reflect the spirit of the override. I'm very concerned about it. Um, the, this department, this school, this um, school district has an extraordinary arts program an extraordinary theater program, an extraordinary music program led by Deb Kuhn. I cannot speak highly enough of what I've witnessed of her work. Just last week, the high school band won a gold at the competition in Washington, D.C., the, the most recent of a long line of accolades and awards won by that band under her leadership. Um, we need to support, cultivate, protect our community resources, our school resources, our extraordinary teachers, mentors, and educators. At particularly at moments like this. Um, the rest of the community, most of us, are coming together to support the override. I urge the school committee, the school district, the high school administration to support these extraordinary leaders. In terms of the school start time, uh, I want to thank all of you for setting up and empowering the committee that's going to report tonight. Um, and uh, for the committee members who, were, who served on that um, uh, you know, school start committee, um, all, of, all of the community members, the teachers, the students, and you folks who served on that committee, volunteering on top of all that you're already doing. So, so many of us so appreciate that work. The committee has long been considering the later high school tar start time because there's extensive and persuasive evidence that a later start time has academic, health, and safety benefits for all students, even high-performing students. And there's evidence that the 7.30 start time hinders the educational experience and performance of a significant number of our high school students. Um, as Zach rec uh, referenced, the, re the front page of the New York Times Sunday Review recently, written by a psychiatrist and professor of psychiatry at New York Uni University Medical School, prevented uh, more and new evidence that ADHD, which has dramatically risen in recent years, is related to sleep deprivation. That's one nor, more new piece of evidence on top of the mounting evidence um, that uh, supports your decision, I hope, to change the start time beginning September 2013. I want to implore you, urge you, to act tonight to make that decision. Um, I'm hopeful that the committee will provide very concrete uh, strategies to make that happen and uh, a lot of us are waiting for your action on this for the coming school year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I think that completes everyone who wished to speak. Um, so we will now uh, close the public comment period and we'll see if there are any announcements from members of the school committee. Mr. Bourne. I had um, two. One is um, the Mass Association of School Committees will be holding their uh, Legislative Advocacy Day on uh, Tuesday, May 21st. Um, it's an opportunity for school committee members to go to Beacon Hill and kind of make our case for what needs to happen at the state level. A couple of the legislative priorities this year are adequate and equitable distribution of Chapter 70 school aid and uh, charter school finance reform. Uh, I'll be going there that day. We have uh, meetings scheduled. I have meetings scheduled right now for uh, 10 o'clock with Senator Rosenberg and 11 o'clock with uh, Peter Kokot's office. Um, <coughs> if there's anybody else from the school committee who wants to join me, they could let me know. I need to get uh, the names of who's going uh, by tomorrow. So um, I want to announce that. The other thing I want to announce is that uh, I'm not going to be running for re-election to the school committee uh, this fall. And uh, it's been a great experience. If there's anybody out there 
in uh, Ward 1 who's interested in running, I'd be happy to uh, speak with them about what it's like to be on the school committee. So. Thank you, Mr. Bourne. <coughs> I have an announcement. Um, I am the liaison to the Northampton Prevention Coalition, and on Wednesday, May 15th, from 6 to 8 p.m. at the uh, JFK Middle School Cafeteria right here, there will be a, a, a workshop with everybody, school connectedness and teen wellness, parents, youth, and schools working together. We will have a keynote speaker, Dr. Chris Overt, a clinical psychologist. Um, the mayor should be there talking. And everyone's invited to come for dinner, to socialize, and to break off into to forum. So that's Wednesday, May 15th, from 6 to 8 at the middle school cafeteria right here. And hope to see people there. Thank you. OK. Any other announcements? About my schedule or, or <laughs> well, you're listed on it. <laughs> just found out. Thank you. Um, you just uh, found out. Ooh. Okay. So um, the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Under recommended actions tonight, we have a consent agenda that includes the approval of minutes of school committee meeting for March 14th and March 28th. Uh, we have uh, two contracts. Uh, one is uh, for Rene Cote, uh, and that's for $8,115.37. And this is for uh, mechanical repairs and maintenance to the Dectron humidification unit at the JFK pool. And then the Hitchcock Center uh, for $10,600, which is a hands on science program for Leeds and Ryan Road. Um, that's to be paid with grant funds. There's also field trip requests, uh, NHS baseball uh, going to Cooperstown, New York on May 15th, and the JFK sixth graders uh, traveling to the Bronx Zoo on May 22nd, 2013. Is there a motion to accept? To approve, and accept, move to accept. approve the consent agenda. Okay. Excellent. Second. Second, okay. Mr. Moore. I'd like to actually, can I? I, there's a one inaccurate thing in the minutes of 3, 14, 13. Okay. Um, so why don't we... Small inaccuracy, so. Um, so why don't we move that off the consent agenda, and we'll take that up as a separate item once we get beyond the consent agenda. Um, so then minus the March 14th uh, minutes, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the consent agenda is approved, um, and now um, why don't we uh, take up the minutes of March 14th, 2013 as a separate item? Second. Second, and then you have an, an, an right, amendment. I'd like, I'd like to offer an amendment to, uh, it's uh, Part B, the NHS student representatives report. Um, it states that the girls basketball team was second in the state. They were second in Western Mass. So there's been a motion to amend to reflect that. Is there a second? Second, yeah. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And then on the um, on the acceptance of those March 14th minutes, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So the March 14th uh, minutes are approved as amended. Now we'll move to reports and recommendations. Um, uh, this would be the time we normally have a report from our student representative, but I believe Alex could not be with us tonight. Uh, so we'll move on to a presentation of the NHS Robotics Club. And I would uh, turn that over to Mr. Newman. All right. <clears throat> So um, I'm Eric Newman. I'm filling a one-year position as a high school science teacher. And uh, I reflect back to last April when I was in an interview. And it was mentioned, oh, and uh, how about you know being the uh, faculty advisor for the robotics team? I said, OK, sure. I had no idea the uh, magnitude of the journey that we were about to embark on. So we'll have introductions here in a minute. But I just want to speak briefly to the group about FIRST. It's this uh, program called US FIRST, founded by Dean Kamen 
student who uh, was an inventor, a uh, you know, scientist, etc. And this program brings in people from you know vertically integrated. We had some of our students coming down to the middle school and working with the Lego Robotics League. We have uh, scientists and engineers working with us. We have uh, the program kind of draws in people that have been involved with the program in years past. So uh, we actually, as the the program got going, uh, some students from Hampshire, some students from around who had been involved in high school came to us to want to be involved with it. So this program, once it happens, it, it just brings in so many people and brings them together. The communication, the working together is just amazing. So, and then there's this horizontal level where we have people that are actually building the robot. And we went to a competition where we saw uh, people that had nothing to do with the technical aspect but were working on the fundraising and the business aspect. There were people that dressed up as mascots and made you know costumes and designed these elaborate set decorations that you know never touched a wire but were as much a part of their team's robotic program as anyone else. And it is just truly it was humbling and it was amazing to see just how many different kinds of people and like I say vertical and horizontal that came together to make these programs happen. So it's been wonderful. So let's uh, just do a quick round of introductions here for the folks that are here. So good. I'm Winnie McMacken. Um, I'm one of the mentors of the team. I work at UTC Aerospace Systems in Connecticut, um, which is one of the sponsors of the team. Um, I'm Joanna Rosenblum. I am a student at Northampton High School. I am on the programming team of the robotics team. Um, I'm Ben Tintuel. I'm a junior in Northampton High School. And I've been working around most of most of the campus. Now, the full functionality of the robot includes a shooter that uh, fires frisbees. We are not activating that here for some obvious reasons. Um, every year there's a different challenge. Last year it was Rebound Rumble, where it shot basketballs. This year it was called Ultimate Ascent, where it uh, fired frisbees at targets and then also had a climbing part. And they'll explain some of the functionality of the robot. And also, the, you know, the wood, it's been, we've, after the one uh, competition, the students uh, got, you know, along with the mentor, said, oh, here's something else we can do. So we'll uh, go ahead and pass it over. All right, so this year, as the stream was nice to point out, the challenge was to be shooting these frisbees and the uh, goals, I don't know, about 30 feet away and about 10 feet up. So we designed a shooter system. It loads in through, the frisbees load in through here to your shoot and then cut, land down here and are shot up in these wheels. Most recently, we've added these wooden side boards, so we were able to climb up onto the pyramid by hooking onto the bars with these uh, holes right there. It's a tubular pyramid. So it might be hard to imagine if you can see it. But it's just a tubular pyramid, and the robot drives right into the pyramid, and then hangs the pyramid. Uh, which is an extra 10 points, which can make or break the back. So this year we have a we had some trouble starting up. We were trying to do more teaching <coughs> with the new members, but it wasn't really coordinated and it was a lot of students teaching students, and many of the students weren't 100% sure of the stuff that they were teaching in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> I know I would run into Mr. Newman's room at, right at the, the end of school, and teach myself a lesson I was going to teach like 20 kids. <laughs> so it works. But we got together, and in January, we found the challenge and started brainstorming designing and coming up with everything. There's a lot of work and rework of the robot as we went from prototypes to the final design of the shooter and the loader. And much of it came together in the last week or two right before the competition. Um, yeah, we also did all the programming for the robot. We had a really knowledgeable programmer, Simon Everhill, who was, you know, a lot of what he's doing. He taught a lot of the programmers stuff through after school lessons and just hands on. It was, it was very fun. <laughs> we had a lot of complimenters like Whitney, um, some of the people who can't be here, like Keith Davis, Scott Clem Scott Barton. Barton. All right. Um, and Dan Costello, who all really helped bring this robot together. And we went to the competition 
uh, back in March. I don't know, I don't remember the exact date, but we last weekend. Last weekend in March. So that it was a really great competition. There's about 50 teams here, all about like 20 to 30 people, all competing in this great big convention center in Hartford. Everyone had their robots, everyone had, had their schedule and their matches. And there was just so much energy and excitement bringing it all together. There was a lot of skill getting learned. I was on the driving team, and so we had a lot of trouble because we had matches like very close together, and after one match, we'd have to go back and fix something that broke or change something that wasn't really working. And so a lot of it was like learning to use our time well and learning to try and get on the practice field so we could test stuff out before we could go back on in like 10, 5 minutes. There was a lot of running back and forth. <laughs> to the competition area. And I was on the stand watching from a lot of it while he was in the field driving the robot. Uh, and it was really exciting seeing. Uh, so basically it's three robots and three robots shooting frisbees into goals and climbing the pyramid. So you can climb the pyramid and uh, put frisbees at the top of the pyramid, which got, what was it, 50 points? 20. 20 points? A lot of points. So this year, the postseason, we've been putting stuff together, like we add the new wood sideboards, because there's some postseason competition we're going to in one week from now. So we're going to that. We're planning a lot better now. We improved the robot, made it work a lot better. Got, got, got some testing done so we can shoot better than before, even though some of our autonomous code is scoring us a ton of points. So we're doing we're doing that. We're, we're trying to integrate more teaching to put people to more time when we're not on such a tight schedule for building our robot. Yeah, we're also trying to get more artists on our team uh, to help with the design part. We're going to paint this climber right here. Um, yeah, we, most we most recently had a logo contest that's finishing up this Friday, so we're trying to make a new logo for our team, although we have we had one this year that was designed by Johanna's sister. We're trying to you know get some more input from more people and more artists in the community and get some people in to especially design some of the like um, mascots and the booths so that we had a robotics which are just beautiful and elegantly designed. So any, uh, yeah, thoughts? Uh, yes, please. Um, I remember, I thought the basketball one was named Paul or something. Does this mm -hmm. one have a name? It's Allegedly, a good... it's Hal. Hal. <laughs> okay. So there you go. There's a real consensus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so. All right, so maybe that'll be an objective for us coming into Battle Cry. So, <laughs> so we'll plug Battle Cry. That's coming up uh, next weekend, uh, Friday night, the 17th, into Saturday, all day, the 18th, down at WPI. And uh, we'll have we'll put publish some details about that, etc. Um, we also have some videos and a presentation that we'll uh, get together and put up on our Facebook page and/or on YouTube, so that you can, you know, get a little more of a look. Like just seeing Hal here and not really seeing like the whole scene, the arena with 50 teams and the you know the pits and noise and six robots at a time moving around and you know you saw him drive a little bit there are three robots on each team driving maneuvering like positioning each other there were some robots that were really good at shooting so then other robots that would come up and block the firing or try and push them out of the way or get into more you know, so there were so many aspects to it and like we said just it was amazing the the vertical and the horizontal how many different kinds of people that are just drawn to this program once they're involved, it was it was just, like I say, humbling and just awesome. So, yeah, um, yes, please. I want to thank you for the presentation, and I, I may have this wrong, but I believe that this presentation part is part of the competition. In other words, when you're at the competition and people are talking to you in the stands, they have uh, maybe some maybe it's a different competition, but. They have like the kind okay. of this, the. We have judges, judges who go around. They talk to you about your robot. Talk to you about your program. Talk to you about what you're doing for robotics. Yeah. Right. Right. Good. And actually, really, really good point because these these folks were there with other teams from across the state, across the region, and at some of the bigger competitions across the nation. And so that was one of the, you know all of these all of us you know talk to people from other teams, problem solve with them. Oh, what did you do for this? Thing? You know, and and right discussing the different aspects of the different systems, how it worked, how the whole thing came together. Because so the different all of the robots are competitions. So just walking around. And Seeing the 60 robots and how everybody attacks the problem um, mm. is a great learning tool in itself. Right, right. Yeah, it was amazing. So, and then a final note then on the community support, one of the big things that the team had to do was fundraise. This was a program that entirely was, you know, self funded. So, UTC, who Whitney works for, you know, G um, GE Healthcare, JCPenney, some of the organizations, the Northampton Education Foundation, and then door to door sales of our light bulbs and other community stuff. So, this is something that, you know, the team wants to get more people in the community knowing about, seeing how exciting and awesome it was, and just get everybody kind of, you know, coming together because it's been a great experience. So. Any other thoughts or questions? Thank, Thank you, folks. You. Come on out to Battle Cry. We'll let you know when it is. Uh, yeah. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Thank you, Hal. <laughs> 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 trusted it. Ben's not using our driver. She still trusted it. Okay. That funny? Well done. Thank you. So the next item on the agenda is uh, do we want to move it right on to the next agenda? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And we have a um, we have a gift uh, this evening that's being presented from People's Bank. Um, and there are three people listed, uh, Janice Mazzallo, Jessica Wales, and Sue Wilson here uh, to make a presentation. And for introduction, our Director of Innovative Instruction and Technology, Angelo Rota, would like to introduce the group from People's Bank. Good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you. Um, and I have great pleasure this evening in introducing uh, representatives from People's Bank. Uh, People's Bank will be opening a new branch in Northampton on King Street very soon. Uh, the three folks with us tonight are Jessica Wales. She is the Northampton Consumer and Business Banking Center branch manager. Uh, she's also uh, a former student at Ryan Road School, JFK Middle School, and graduated from Northampton High School. Uh, Janice Mazzallo is the Senior Vice President, Human Resources for People's Bank, and she lives in Florence. And the uh, Vice President for Corporate Responsibility, Susan Wilson, is also here. And please welcome them. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, and thank you so much 
for this opportunity to say a few words about People's Bank and about our donation to the Northampton Public Schools. Academic excellence is a priority for us and something that we have been involved with in the communities that we serve. We are also very passionate about innovation and technology and I just love what the robotics team is doing. With this donation of five projector and document camera sets, we are excited about bringing additional uh, innovation and technology into your classrooms. In the very near future, as Angelo said, we will be opening our uh, green part, uh, office here in Northampton, and we will be coming a part of the larger Northampton community. And in addition, because our office is lead registered, we'll be bringing additional innovation and technology to the community, which will also mean that People's Bank will continue to support this community in a variety of ways including academic excellence. So thank you so much again for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to move to accept the gift. Okay. So there's been a motion made Second. to accept and seconded. Um, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? And the community thanks you very much for the gift. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a presentation by the Late Start Ad Hoc Committee um, as represented by uh, one of our former colleagues, uh, uh, Lucy Hartree, as chair. Good evening. <laughs> My name is Lucy Hartree and I served as the chair of the Ad Hoc Start Time Subcommittee. It's good to be back. Uh, at a school committee meeting, although I must say it's way better, more relaxing to be on this side of the podium rather than that. <laughs> um, first, I would like to thank the yeah, members of the ad hoc yeah. <laughs> who worked so hard. Um, we met for a couple of hours every Tuesday afternoon for three months, and many did hours and hours of homework as well. The members, some of them are here, and so I would ask them to stand up or wave or whatever when I say their names. Um, Ezekiel Baskin, from, it was a new, new, he's a student at NHS, Best Detmold community member, Blue Duval School Committee. Uh, Randy Gordon, I don't believe is here, he's a teacher at uh, NHS. Steve Harrell, a community member. Janet Hicks is also a uh, faculty member at the high school. Harvey Hill, community member. Uh, Howard Moore, school committee. Johanna Renard, a school uh, NHS student. And myself, I'm a community member. Uh, I'd also like to thank the school personnel and community members uh, who took the time to help us with our research. Uh, for those in the audience and those at home watching who have not actually read the report, and actually Steve has uh, several copies he can circulate if you're interested. I believe you all have them, correct? Um, uh, let me tell you a little bit about our process and summarize the results of our work. Then I'll open it up to questions and ask the rest of the subcommittee members uh, be recognized because their expertise will be needed, I'm sure, to answer some of the questions, and they did most of the work. <laughs> um, so Northampton, as well as other communities in the area and the state and country, has been looking at the issue of start times for quite some time. Each time the issue has come up here in Northampton, legitimate concerns and questions were raised, and each time the decision was set aside. Late last year, the school committee decided to form a subcommittee to look at the potential obstacles and to determine whether they could be overcome. That was us. Most precisely, our charge was to, quote, investigate the implementation issues surrounding a later start time at the high school, including effects on budget, school start, and end times district-wide, and any related topics. To accomplish the task, we investigated and discussed the following topics. Length of school day, extra help time, transportation, athletics, 
extracurricular activities, the recreation department, Smith College classes, internships, after school jobs, and childcare. We consulted the superintendent, the athletic director, and coaches, the guidance department, internship coordinator, the transportation supervisor, members of clubs and extracurricular activities, employers in Northampton, the recreation department, members of the administrative team, and NHS faculty, administrators, and staff. The subcommittee recommends the school committee approve a start time of 8.15 and a release time of 2.35. These start and end times are based on shortening the school day by 10 minutes, which is achieved by reducing the current passing, the current eight minute passing time to six minutes and the length of each of the blocks from 85 to 84 minutes. These changes still meet the Massachusetts Department of Education requirement. The subcommittee makes this recommendation because the results of our research convinced the subcommittee members that all the identified later start time obstacles and issues were addressed and have workable solutions. For instance, the extracurricular activities in clubs can adjust to a later release time. Most of the athletic competitions can accommodate a later release time or can be slightly adjusted. Special education transportation can be arranged within the diff different time frame. Extra teacher help time can still be provided and Smith classes can still be accessed. In addition, and perhaps most importantly, the high school uh, time change does not affect any other school start or end time and there is no additional cost to the district. The current Northampton High School schedule is not perfect for all nor will a new one suit everyone. But, will, but it will take into account the significant sleep research and current best practices around start times for adolescents, and it will make a positive change for the majority of students. The subcommittee respectfully urges the school committee to ad adopt a later start time. Thank you. So that's my presentation. Um, I guess I'd like to open it up to questions or comments, um, and but if it's okay, if I can, I'm, I'm sure I can't answer all the questions. So if other members of the committee, of the, our subcommittee, um, have comments, I would hope they would be heard. Okay. So, uh, do members of the school committee have any questions or about the report that you've received? First of all, I want to say thank you to everyone that was involved in the committee. I know that it's, uh, it's quite a bit of work and time that's needed in order to put something like this together and then collect the data and then uh, present it. So I'm grateful for that. I do have a couple of questions. Um, I'll start with the, the idea that you have here in regards to um, shaving one minute off of each class. Mm -hmm. um, I think in a day in age where we think about education and the importance of student-teacher contact and how we can get more of that um, in even recent discussions that we've had as a school committee on um, longer school day. Um, I was surprised to see that one of the recommendations would be to actually take uh, student-teacher contact away in order to accommodate the, uh, uh, you know, the, the change in the time. So I don't know if you could speak to that at all. And I do know that the state requires the 990 hours of right. contact time. And by doing this, you certainly would make, um, we'd still make that number. And uh, that's the state minimum, if you will. And mm -hmm. we know that even in building our own budget, we know what the state says for a foundation budget for Northampton. But we always exceed that because we know the importance right. of education and what it costs. And so I am a bit concerned or would like to hear as to what the rationale would be behind mm -hmm. taking that time away from students and teachers? Well, I, w I will ask any member to add to this, but um, it's certainly, I certainly understand your, your question and your concern. Uh, the rationale um, was that it still, as, it, as I said, it still meets all the state requirements and there is a cushion um, and that we felt that the one minute that was saved 
in the class time and the two minutes saved between the four classes, which really only results in six minutes, of course, because there are only three passing times, um, would give the extra 10 minutes that enabled the, the start time to be just a little later. And we felt that the, the trade-off uh, of those 10 minutes was, was worth it. Um, that, that one minute, I mean, every minute counts, so I don't discount that, but uh, that was the rationale. So it that seems like one the, minute yeah. could, could make a difference. Uh, those four extra minutes that we added to the six in the passing time that we saved. So we had like a 30 hour overage before, I believe, and now it would go down to 18 hours or something like that. And you spoke to Nancy Athis about that, and she believes that uh, with testing and different things that come about during the school year, we would still be, um, you know, in compliance with the 990 hours from the state. Uh, we, I did send uh, that section of the report to Nancy, and she didn't have any comments, so I don't know if that means she agrees with it or supports it. Uh, I just, that was our proposal and, and there were no, I didn't get any comments, so. Um, yeah, yeah, I would note there are, there are other high schools in the state that have 84 minute class periods. Yeah. Um, so clearly they're able to function. Sure, but. I mean, well, no, without running into the problem with, you know, if you have, you know, when you when you have a late start for, for MCAS, or when you have, that, and that's, that's what that cushion is necessary for. So, so in terms of, in terms of meeting the requirement, it, does, it clearly is possible for those schools to Did you have more questions? I do, but I would, you know, I would defer to somebody else to come back. Ms. Pick? So um, I also would really, really like to thank the committee for the work that's done. I, mean, it, I, I know that you've done an enormous amount of, of research and um, I, I especially appreciate the people who have already been involved for so long, who weren't too burnt out to do this all over again, <laughs> and to do it, and, and to do it um, in an, as objective a way, and to really answer all the questions that have been coming up. That it, and this was so clearly outlined. I really want to appreciate that. In, in terms, and, and I don't mean to dismiss your concern at all, but I'd like to think that if the kids are a little bit more alert, it's going to make up for the one minute that they're going to miss in that. Class. I was going to say that. <laughs> and, and I and I don't mean to dismiss learning time. But one minute in each class, if they're alert and they're getting it, so the teacher doesn't have to repeat something because half the kid half the kids were asleep the first time, <laughs> that might work out just fine. Um, does did your committee talk at all about um, how to um, um, gauge how well this is working? To how to kind of do a follow up review? I know you weren't charged with that, so I'm. I'm, I'm um, so, um, fair to say that I'm a strong um, proponent of having a later start time at the high school, and um, I, I know this is really riding on the back of the fact that we're not going to have busing next year. Um, um, so that that piece of it feels difficult to me. Not about this, but the idea of not having high school busing. I still haven't quite wrapped my head around. But given that, I, I think that this is, um, I, I haven't come up with anything that doesn't make this a fabulous p proposal, and I'm certainly you know, going to listen to everything that's being said tonight. Um, I just lost the point that I wanted to make. Oh, but I do think that it's going to be important for the school committee to um, take notes of the kinds of, of um, issues that we should be checking in over the course of the year to see if things need to be fine-tuned anyway, what's not getting addressed? Well, you know, you're saying that most of the sports, you know, are going to be able to accommodate. Well, I want to know about the ones that can't. Mm -hmm. um, and and to know, you know, from the athletic director how this is working. And, and I think that it would be important if we pass this to make sure that we get some sort of report, not not at the end of the year, but part way through, so that we know, you know, are there, are there problems that need to be addressed? Are there issues that, of concern? You, you, 
I wasn't sure if there was an answer. Or I'm not sure I have an answer. Question. I mean, it wasn't okay. really a question. Okay. It was a comment. Yeah, Mr. Flynn. So, I mean, one of the things that comes up a lot for us, people ask us uh, regarding the start time is, um, why in the face of all this research do we um, delay and why, why hasn't there been consensus? And obviously there's something here that, that makes it drag on. And I think one of the things is that as an elected body, we represent a wide range of constituents. And a lot of times when we've looked at this issue and surveys have been conducted, there hasn't been this huge number of people in support of it. It's been sort of right around that mid-range uh, with faculty, with students, with parents. And I'm noticing that in, in the, um, the results of your survey, two-thirds of the people surveyed are not in favor of it in, in your survey. Um, it's that, consistent that, with that's what? That's teachers, Mike. I'm sorry. Oh, teachers. OK. So two um, thirds. I mean, we only surveyed the teachers. Right. But, uh, and the faculty, I mean, the administrators. Right, but there, there's been other surveys done of the community and um, over the years with this, and it all comes out consistently where it's, it's either really 50-50 or it's, you know, it, but it's not anything where we think, wow, this is, there's just a movement here with everyone, like, why are we not doing this? And that's why there's this delay here, because there's a lot of things beyond just looking at research that we have to take into account for. And so that's, I guess, to offer some clarification uh, for people who've questioned that for a while. Um, I think Howard wants to say something too, but I would just answer that by we acknowledge that fact, um, but I believe the part part of the reason there has been resistance, both at, you know at the school level, the faculty level, and the community level, is that all the issues that we addressed and feel we have workable solutions for were raised as obstacles. And since we've answered those, or at least we feel we have, um, maybe not perfectly, and there will need to be some tweaking along the way, um, but because we feel we've answered them, I think that that would alleviate many people's concerns, or, or they might feel more supportive um, of, of a move, knowing that it doesn't mean that Northampton High School won't be able to participate in athletics or, or athletic competitions. It's certainly, they'll still be able to take Smith classes. They may be different level, uh, classes or time periods, but they'll still be able to take them. They'll be able to find them. Um, they'll be able to do their internships. They'll be able to do after school jobs. I mean, all these things that people were concerned about, I believe have been answered. So at least to a large degree. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I think it's the, all the people who have spoken to me who were opposed to a start time were not really opposed to a change in start time. They were opposed to a change in start time because they thought it would mean the end of track or the end of swimming or, you know. And um, I think what we've done when we looked at whether or not it would mean that, and it doesn't. Um, in fact, doesn't in most of those cases, it doesn't have really any impact on when practice would be or when competitions would be at all. So, you know, I think, uh, and then the other one, you know, the uh, help time with teachers, I think, is a big one, obviously, that um, what it actually does is it, it's funny, it gives more options in terms of when students can meet with teachers because if you're, <coughs> you, you know, Essentially, the only pe people who are affected would be people who are doing sports and meaning coaches or athletes um, after school. And everybody else is still perfectly free to go ahead and do teacher help after school. And it opens up the space before school, which currently is first period when we've heard we have 900 kids, a large number are asleep. And instead, it will be the kids who need to come in for work could do it then at the same exact time that they're currently coming in to go to school. And so, it, it, you know, in other words, it means you could arrange to meet with your teacher before or after school instead of, instead of what currently happens, particularly in season, is that there are days when you simply cannot meet with a teacher after school because you or your teacher is going to a competition somewhere. So I think it, it, it actually creates some more flexibility and doesn't, it doesn't end that it, it people it, it just means it to be a different time right but so the the ones who are going to be seeking that extra help are the ones who are struggling need that but so one one option would be for those kids to get up 
just as, as early as they are now to come and get the extra Actually, help. a little later. Be, no, they wouldn't have to get up every day. Right. I mean, maybe once a week, and they'll have four night, four mornings where they can sleep a little in. Um, Steve also wanted to say right, something. Right, but you're right. That's okay. The mic. Can you talk into the mic, Steve? Thanks. For the people at home. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> my name is Steve Harrell, and I was a member of the special ad, ad hoc committee. And uh, just to respond to what Mike Flynn uh, raised, um, we did do the teacher uh, survey. <clears throat> there were other questions, of course, besides that one. Uh, but I. I do want to say that in uh, a school, uh, seven school districts around the city of Minneapolis, uh, which has generated uh, one of the best and most comprehensive uh, research uh, studies uh, that have been done on this issue, um, about half of the teachers beforehand, before a change, were opposed to it. And then several years later, when they were asked again, if they would like to go back, only 3.5% said that they would like to go back. Now that kind of uh, statistic is reported in many other school districts across the country. Um, so bear that in mind. Now also I would like to say that um, we also provided in our survey room for comments. And many of the comments revealed why many of the teachers say they are opposed to the change. And here I want to say with great respect, I think the Northampton High School faculty is fantastic. Uh, my daughter uh, went there for four years. I've had contact with a lot of the faculty and they are just terribly impressive and do a fantastic job. Um, they know a lot about their subjects and they know a lot about teaching and education. But in the comments on the survey, uh, they did unfortunately reveal that they were not familiar with the research on start times. And I don't blame them for that. They're very busy. But they said they would make comments that were completely opposed to what the research shows. For example, a number of them said they were opposed to the later start time because they think that uh, students will just stay up later and still not get enough sleep. That has been completely discounted numerous times in a lot of research. So that was just not right. They also uh, made some comments that uh, they didn't think that the change of the uh, 45 minutes was enough, was not significant enough. That is also flies in the face of the research and evidence. Every 15 minutes counts. The same amount of time that the start time is delayed is about how much extra sleep the students receive. So uh, I think we really have to think very carefully about putting too much emphasis on that 65% uh, of the faculty that say they were opposed. Thank you. I'd like to follow up on that, um, what Steve was stating. And um, in the back, on, um, when we have the appendix, we have um, some Appendix C responses for start time survey. And when the teachers were asked the different percentages, the highest percentage of, of um, as a staff member, would you have to make any changes in the following if the high school schedule changed? The highest percentage was 54% were for non-school related after school commitments. And it also kind of reminds me, I was talking to some students and I asked, um, this boy said he was totally against it. And I said, why? He said, well, it might help me get more sleep, but it's not the way things are. And I like to keep things the way things are. I don't like change. Mm -hmm. And I said, do you think that you could use more sleep? He said, well, yes, but I probably wouldn't sleep very well because it changed. <laughs> and he didn't like change. And, and I'm thinking that just a lot of people sometimes just don't like change. And change itself is a, is a difficult adjustment. But once we get to where we're going, then it might be easier. And as for Mike, Mr. Flynn's comment and um, regarding, what were you talking about, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> I know I lost it too. The, with the, thing. the survey and then the after school help and before school help. All right, well, if it comes back, I'll be back. It was gold, whatever I said. It was I'm sure it yeah. was gold. <laughs> Mr. Bourne. 
I had a, a quick question about the um, Smith College classes. Mm -hmm. So I was just reading through it and it said um, NHS students wouldn't be able to take 9 a.m. classes anymore. Um, no classes during the third period at Northampton High and classes meeting at 1 and 110 they couldn't take. And I was just curious to, like, I'm just trying to get a sense of um, like what percent of classes that they currently take would they be able to take uh, under this scenario, and I mean, it may be a great, it may be like a greater good argument that mm -hmm. it's something we need to cut because there's, you know, it's more important to have a later start time than to, and this is, the, you know, one of the mom, you know prices we have to pay. But just, I kind of didn't reading through that, didn't understand what the, like, well, well, how how much that would limit the offerings that they currently have when you make all these calculations. It's a little bit of a moving target. Uh, uh, first of all. Uh, Smith could change their schedule, not maybe ne this coming year because that might it's probably too late. Well, to I'm do saying that, ba based on the current situation. Based I guess. on the current schedule, um, I I'm real. I don't know that we know can exactly answer. Is that it half question. or three quarters? Um, I think they just have to be more flexible. It's not that they can't take it. That it's that it's still available. We decided that there were two courses classes available. Um, they may just have to take different currently they different may have to courses, take it, right? not It'd necessarily be, different courses because yeah. that's one of the things they say is that they do go for the courses but at different times also that there are a lot of different times available throughout the day and it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly when it is now so it still ended up being two courses as far as the actual courses we really couldn't tell because Smith rotates their what courses they offer at different times and so certain people are looking for certain classes uh, like more so than others. Best would be the one to answer. And there are also, I don't know, Best can answer or add to this, but there are also, I mean, there are other classes later in the day. Uh -huh. Now, I know that's not within the confines of the school day, but if a student is very anxious to take a Smith class, they uh -huh. certainly could uh, later in the day, like at 1 o'clock or, I mean, uh -huh. excuse me, 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock. Also Holyoke like Community even. College. I mean, there are other colleges, too, but that's a different uh, that's a different uh, scenario, but um, so the answer is we just it, it will change, uh -huh. and I think it'll take some flushing out. But uh -huh. the, the bottom line is whether I, I don't, I can't tell you whether uh -huh. there will be exactly the same number of options. There, I can tell you for sure there will be options, and. Um, I, I just I just I just don't really know. I don't, best, do you can you add to that? I wanted to add a couple of things. Um, there's, there is no question that there are that there are more nine o'clock classes than ten o'clock classes, but they would still have the the option of taking ten o'clock classes and classes later in the day and in the evening, and a number of kids already do that. Do that. And I thought after we finished our report that one of the things I wish we had included and didn't was a list of the courses that kids take at Smith. It really um, backed up what our student reps told us, that most kids look for a course that fits in their schedule. They're not looking for a specific course. Mm -hmm. And if you, you see the list of of course, just, just quickly to name a few. Afterlife and world religions, plant physiology, um, introduction to comparative politics, textiles and fashion in contemporary Africa, extraordinary events in life and in the climate, introduction to neuroscience, Chinese one, elementary Russian, modern Korean history, landscape environment and design, writing about sports, you can see the range is, is we should huge. All go back to college. It's huge. And, I did find that one of the things that concerned me was where there were a lot of kids that were looking to advance in sequences in languages or in math. And yeah, there seemed to be some, but not a lot. So that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Can I ask one other Sure. Um, yes, and then we also wanted to ask uh, uh, Principal Athis if she wanted to add okay. any comments. But go ahead. I just had a question about the six minute passing time. I mean, I don't know what it's like to move quickly that quickly from one part of the school is that do you think that's pretty doable well the the teachers on the committee felt that it was okay uh, I, I certainly can't answer that yeah <laughs> so, okay. um that that you know no matter how they'll get to their class uh -huh. uh, 
and, and faculty teachers are very flexible, allowing students to use the restroom if they uh, have okay. time during passing time. But for the most part, uh, the faculty thought that it was possible. Okay. That's in Appendix C. Mr. Shelf. One question you you may have already answered again, but I, just for my own clarity, there, in here there's the suggestion that extra help could take place before school. There's also the suggestion that football practice, for instance, might be better off before school. Mm -hmm. And there's also the suggestion that child care for some families would be made easier because the high school students will be home later in the morning. Correct. So, which to me seems a little bit odd because shouldn't they be sleeping instead of taking care? <laughs> Simply. But, so I guess I'm just wondering, there seems to be a lot of, well, let's just use this time in the morning for stuff that doesn't fit anywhere else. And that just seems a little counterintuitive to me. Yes. That's well, yeah, the answer is pretty straightforward. It's right now we have 900 kids, um, about 120 of them who have to get up to get on a bus by 6.30 in the morning. Um, all the other 900 have to be there at 7.20 or 7.25. Um, instead of that, the football, it was only for the, the, right now, football doesn't have enough time to practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, they, they have space between the end of school and the start of practice, and then it gets dark during the month of November. They're the only fall sport that has a season in November. So currently, their, their practices are cut way short because the only lit field we have is the playing field, which they can't practice on because they'll ruin it. Right? Mm -hmm. So all so the thing would be then for football would be they could either put their practice right at the end of school Right. which would actually be starting it sooner than it currently is, which would give them more daylight. And then if they needed to go to teacher help and things, they could do that before school. And again, it's for three weeks, instead of for the whole year. It's for the 60 kids instead of the 900. So it's not counterintuitive at all. It's really about adding up the numbers. Um, so we're saying that, that we're just taking the lesser of two evils in a sense. No, we're not really. No, we're, we're, saying, we're saying, look, it take, we only have 24 hours in a day. Right. We should put the school chunk in the in the chunk that makes the, as much sense as we can make it in terms of what we know about sleep and and student outcomes. Put it there, and if we can, and, and again, where it goes exactly has to do with things like the sun sets at a certain time. We have competitions that have to get yeah, done before I, the sun I sets, understand. so we can't move it as late actually as the research would say. Um, and the the other sorts of problems, you know, they're not really problems. They're just look. You, you, you just when you do stuff when you do it. I mean, I don't know when, when I don't know when you brush your teeth, but you do it sometime during the day. Yes, you know? yeah. most days. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but you know, but it's also the same suggestion comes in for basketball as well. But know, again, as a possibility. It, uh, I, I'm just it, all, it also comes in for basketball as well, precisely because right now basketball practice is way too late. It, it, during the mm -hmm. and again, just during the two weeks before the schedule starts, before the competition schedule. So for two weeks trying to put five teams practicing for two hours, you can quickly do the math, and you can see that if you start doing it at the end of the school day, you, do, you get done very late at night, okay? And the coaches do a good job of trying to overlap and share space in the gym, but it still ends up with practice ending around 10 o'clock, which is pretty late, yeah. but it's for two weeks. Of course, their game schedules, they get home around right. then, too, when they have away games, so it's kind of the norm for basketball people is to be getting in kind of late and then doing their homework after that. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that if you can move the start of the school day, just even for those same kids, later by 45 minutes, you're not going to, you're right, they're still going to be out till 10 o'clock coming home from an away game, but they'll have an extra 45 minutes of sleep before they go to school the next morning. Um, and I just wanted to make an observation though. Brian. I don't, passing time, lots of things can happen during passing time. You know, it's time for kids to talk to teachers really quickly, go to the restroom, so I don't want to, you know, I don't want to pass that by. I just want to make that comment. Thank you. But the teachers were asked um, about that in, in their survey, and um, it was it was fine for that. Oh, I Forty percent for all all the different sizes. Look at yeah, Appendix C. Six percent. Right. These. They, so. Look at this okay. Number, this number there. Yeah. So. Um, I do have one other question. Let's see. When you survey, we're talking a lot about um, teachers being able to meet with students before school and or after school. Have you, what do the teachers tell you about that? I mean, I don't want to be taking for granted that, okay, now teachers can come in earlier or stay, and stay later. I mean, they, they, they are, 
I know they're, they're bound to give a certain amount of time outside the classroom and it's going to be, I, I would assume, up to them how it's going to, you know, when they're going to offer their hours. So I don't think we can assume that if somebody needs help that well they can meet early with their teacher. I mean, t right. did you get any sense from teachers about about their feelings? Not, on that? not specifically, but um, at least the teachers on our committee felt that um, there would be now the option of doing it earlier rather than later, or you know, before school rather than after. Some might take advantage of that, and some might not be able to, um, but. It, now, no one would come in early. No student is going to come in early, any earlier than they already have to. So this allows at least a little, that, uh, that, that flexibility, which they didn't have before. But I don't know how many student, uh, teachers, excuse me, would take, and or students, would take advantage of coming in earlier. That would be one of the issues I would think that we'd want to pay attention to. Are students getting the time that they need? Or right. can their teachers offer them the time that, they, that works? Mr. Meyer, did you have a? No, actually, it was, I, I just Stephanie stole my question. I just I just looked at the the survey said 48 percent that they would have to make a change in help time, and I just was wondering whether there had been you know when you have a survey that's not real specific, was there any attempt to follow up and say, well, what what change is that? Is that restricting it? Is that because um, that that would be very important, I think, for we, we kept the survey fairly sh very short and and as simple as we could. Because right, none of us had time to evaluate. None of us really had the experience, and we didn't want teachers to have to spend an hour filling out the survey. So uh, we didn't do any follow up. Okay, could we? Uh, Maybe Lucy could stay up there for a moment, but Nancy was waiting to respond to something that was said a few people ago, so <laughs> I want to make sure she gets a chance to be heard. I just wanted to respond to the Smith College, and I think I've been on a committee for five years investigating this as well, but I just can't emphasize the importance of the uh, collaboration with Smith College, and I would really like to um, look at a proposed schedule of what the hours would look like during the day because m most of our kids take classes at 9 or 10.30 and we have the two hour window and then maybe the one o'clock class and, it, and honestly if they, um, probably about 80 students right now are taking classes over the course of the full year and if they weren't able to do it, it would make a huge impact on our high school schedule. We do not have enough electives for seniors and so um, we can be flexible, we could have the kids start at nine. Some kids are doing that, you know, they go to Smith for three classes and come to us for one. But if it impacts in any way a large majority of students who can't use that time at Smith College, um, it, it would be impactful to the, to the high school. We couldn't house the kids. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Zahowski. I had a, a question on Appendix E. This goes back to sports uh, and athletics. At first, when I read it and I went down, and it was very thoroughly done, and every sport was spoken to with times and, and information, the, the first thing that really was appealing to me was that uh, many of the paragraphs ended by saying that uh, allowing even for 45 minutes of travel, a 25, uh, 235 dismissal creates no conflict with class time or daylight. And I, and I, I thought that was great because one of the concerns I have is that um, when you have an away game, uh, many times there's an early dismissal for a sports team because they need to get a, to a competition. And um, this reads, or at least I understand it, to suggest that um, the 235 dismissal is no conflict with class time. And I think of my own experience as a varsity coach and riding a bus and I started to do the math and it the math just doesn't work for me so I, I just wanted maybe someone to speak to that or clarification if if we get out at 235 and we take a 45 minute bus ride we get to our destination at 320 for a four o'clock competition now that sounds pretty good because there's still 40 minutes before kickoff or first pitch it's or, really 330 or, or, or whatever it is say again it's really 330 because you can't 
the moment you leave well, the classroom. You can't. Right, so, right, exactly. So my point exactly that if you're getting out at 2.35 and students are asked to go to the locker room, change their clothes, get their gear, get the equipment, load the bus, and get on their way, that it, it is, Howard, closer to 3.30. Uh, I know for home games myself as a, as a high school baseball coach, we get to our field at 2.30 and our competitions are at 3.30. And within that hour, we have just about enough time to accomplish what we need to do before we start. By the time we put our cleats on, we stretch, we throw, we take our infield during our allotted time, the other team takes their infield at the allotted time, and we meet with the umpires, you know, it takes about an hour. So to arrive 30 minutes before the competition just doesn't seem feasible. And I was surprised that um, Jim Miller said that that certainly was fine, or the coaches that you spoke to said there wouldn't be any conflict with, um, with class time, because I, I don't see how it works with that amount of time. So uh, I mean, I'll let Howard answer that. I, I mean, yeah. um, I, I, you know, there, it'll be tight. The 45 minutes plus the 30 minutes is, you know, 30 minutes for a warm up and, and 45 minutes for, a, for a travel, which obviously varies a lot. Sure. I mean, it's not, um, right. Yeah, and, you, and, and yeah, there's a big difference, and, and there's also no way to anticipate in terms of the warm-up because again, the weather can affect how much time it takes for a warm-up, as well as just the field conditions and a whole host of different things. Um, so that was those are just ballpark numbers because well, they're ballpark numbers. Um, the interesting thing for again the. The game is really interesting. The scheduled times of competitions right now, the, most of them have a lot of slack before sunset. Um, I guess because I don't know, unless you unless you go into really lots of extra innings in baseball, in general, a four o'clock start should get you done. Um, the the sports that don't have that kind of uh, leeway are in the fall, because it's an hour sooner that the sun sets in the fall than it is in the spring, um, and. Those are the sports that I think I highlighted here. You know, the field hockey, for example, which has really got the biggest crunch because they play two games on one field and they play in the fall. And they do not play on lit fields. So they have no, no wiggle room, you know, the sun sets. And um, they currently have that problem right now. I mean, we, they're, they're, one of their coaches talked to us and, um, and pointed out that their games get their JV games, which they do second after the varsity games. Um, routinely get cut short in, at the end of October because of sunset. So really, that, that's an issue that needs to be addressed <laughs> anyway. They need to figure out some sort of a scheduling thing so as to either be able to, like, just for those, again, just for those end of season games, either be able to b borrow a field from, like, another college. Like, for example, if we could borrow a field for three games at Smith, or if you know, Westfield could borrow a field for three games at Westfield State, um, to do that so they could play them simultaneously or to schedule those games for the weekend because those those games right now the, the JV is cut short because of sunset in other words, it's, it's a real issue and it obviously isn't made better by school getting out later um, the the only two ways you can do it are either reschedule just like that which they ought to do right now it happened but they ought to um, that would be the simplest and best way I think really the other way obviously is early dismissal for three games, which, you know, as, again, as crucial as class time is, a whole lot of kids from the high school went and watched the movie Lincoln. And now they missed all their other classes that weren't really Lincoln movie related for that day. They missed way more time in each of those classes than they would miss if they played field hockey and got dismissed half an hour early every time. So. You know, there's, a, there's always a trade-off here, and I personally, as much as I think going to see a movie Lincoln is a fine thing, I actually think that participation in sports is a better thing. And um, so I feel it's worth that kind of a trade-off. If we feel it's worth it to go to a movie, I think we should actually feel it's worth it to participate in sports. So I guess my, I, I don't know if I got my question answered. My question was that, and what I was trying to bring to light is that under the current uh, structure and what's stated here, it doesn't seem as though an early dismissal is needed. My comment would be that I believe that even 
with a 235 dismissal and a four o'clock competition, students might still find themselves getting out early in order to get to mm. the site and do the proper warm up. Oh, right, and so then my suggestion is that except for the field hockey, and you Just know, because it reads in here, and anyone yeah. that might read it, this document would say, well, that sounds better than the current situation because well, most students don't have early dismissal though. I mean, mostly at the high school, there's only early dismissal for the things that, well, I say early dismissal. Skiing has early dismissal. Golf has early dismissal. Okay, Golf I, gets I eight I times, they get dismissed early. I was under the impression that away games at some no. times during the year were dismissed early. Not That's very often, common no. practice at my high school, but I guess here in Northampton, mm -hmm. they found a way not to do it. We had to know. Right. Mostly not. I mean, according, at least the information I collected. Mostly not. And, and so yeah. lastly, I would just make a comment on the on the swimming because it, you know, the pool is a, is a hot topic, mm -hmm. certainly. And uh, we, we have practice currently at 3 o'clock mm -hmm. for swimmers, and we're getting out at 2.35. I'm wondering how 25 minutes is sufficient time to get to JFK to the pool, especially kids that might be taking the bus here to get here. Well, the only answer about that is that, again, I've seen lots of swimmers elsewhere <laughs> long I, who take that much amount of time to get there so I, I don't really you know yeah they'll have to go directly or, I mean that's true okay. yeah or everything gets pushed a little bit further for the well, I don't department. think we can do that with well, you don't want to do that <laughs> I don't want to do that no but they, they have different hours they don't just go after school they also have in the evening sometimes okay any other questions or comments about uh, the report that you have before you Okay, and um, well, thank you very much, uh, okay. Lucy, and thank you to the committee members Spur. for all their service. Edward, thanks for asking us to do this, I think. <laughs> <laughs> thank <Okay>. you. <laughs> okay, so um, the, uh, yes. So what do we do with this now that we're here? I mean, and, um, can we make a motion to vote on it? Do we? need more information I mean what do we I, it just feels to me like we're just moving ahead and maybe that's what we are doing maybe that's what we're supposed to be doing but I'm just kind of well clearly there's been uh, this is a we asked a committee to work on this and provide us with a report and okay. so we've now received the report and the, it's you know the committee uh, can uh, it's the committee's pleasure I suppose that you can we didn't advertise that there'd be a vote tonight but we could certainly take it under advisement and then put it on a future agenda for cons for an actual well, I would like to move that we take a vote on this at some point I mean I'm not quite sure how to go about doing it but I would yep. definitely like to take a vote on this and that certainly it can certainly be placed on a future agenda I think okay, that's well, I move to have this placed on an agenda as soon as possible since we have the report and we have what we need and if we need more then to to say what we need and to go back and get what we need if, if that's what it is. Okay. Could I ask before you make your motion final to, to actually specify the, perhaps for our next meeting so that this doesn't get pushed out? Right, okay, I would like to move that it be done exactly at the next meeting so it doesn't get pushed away. I will second the motion. Okay. Uh, our next meeting, are we talking about the one this next? Regular meeting. Not the, the next regular meeting. Unless you'd like to vote about it tonight. <laughs> so. <laughs> So there's been a motion made and seconded to have this item placed now on our June regular meeting agenda. And is that why we can't vote on it tonight? Because it needs to have, I mean, that's what I was wondering and thought anyway, that we need to have, in a, uh, uh, have it moved ahead. I mean, or could we vote on it tonight? I mean, or is there more information needed? Because if there's something just left out there hanging, we'd like to know what it is so that it can be addressed and then go on and off this plate. I mean, like, let's go forward. Well, I'm, you're looking at me. I, well, I'm looking uh, at you because I don't know what the rules are. I don't know if because it wasn't advertised right to now. vote. Well, I know that we had a report presented to us tonight. So I can make so, a motion to vote on it tonight. Uh, I suppose you could do that, sure. I, yeah, you could make that motion, certainly. I don't see why not. Does anybody see why not? No, you have to Lisa make sees motion. why not. <laughs> you have to make the motion and then... <laughs> well, I would like to make a motion to vote on, um, to vote to approve a late start time. And make it tonight. What else do you want? Okay. <laughs> what else do you want? So be? there's been a motion made to approve. Now, oh. it, uh, are you specifying when this uh, approval Could, will be late? How about now? You're making a motion to to propose the specific proposal that's been brought forward. Is that correct? 
I didn't hear you. I'm sorry, Miss. You said you just want to vote on a change in start time, right? But you're, are you act, you're voting? You're making a motion for the specific proposal that was brought forward by the committee. Well, I would think so because there was a lot of work put into that, and there was a lot of thought, and we talked to a lot of people. And although I didn't personally talk to um, like Mr. Miller, and, and I talked to other people, but um, we had a lot of um, positive feedback from everybody that we talked to, and um, so I just don't see why not. Maybe I'm missing something. I'm still kind of new, and I won't be able to keep saying that. And, but right now, I still am. I don't know what I'm doing. All the way. Do I make a motion for now? <laughs> um, Hell. So uh, there's a motion on the table. Well, there's been a motion. A couple motions. <laughs> there's a motion on the table, but uh, but then the no. maker of the Second. motion Second. wanted to then propose a new motion. So. Well, I didn't know I could. See, that's what I was trying to ask you. Is because it wasn't posted on the agenda. We are going to vote. Make a motion. Do we have to? So why don't you withdraw your original and, and make a... Okay, I'd like to make a motion to vote on this, um, to vote to approve um, the proposal that was set forth by the ad hoc committee and, um, yes, tonight, now. That was second the motion. Okay, the motion's been seconded. <laughs> so now the question before the school committee is on voting to uh, approve the uh, recommendation of the... Uh, of the committee. Sure. sure. If we voted no tonight, does it mean we could vote? I mean, if I want to, if I want to vote on this in June, does that mean I have to vote no tonight? Uh, That's my question. I mean, you guys have talked to a lot more people. Why would you want to? Because you've talked to a lot more people in the community than I have. Okay, so you want to go back and take it to the community, is what? Is I want to vote on this in June, so I, I want to know what I need to do to do that. I want to wait a month. Okay. A month. So, if you vote it down, it does. You doesn't mean that you can't. I vote, wait, I, it's if I vote no. Mm -hmm. Can I? Can I do that and still? Can you reconsider? Yes, you can have sure. another motion yeah. in June. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, um, two things. Um, one is that I'm going to vote in favor of this tonight because I think that we have heard from the community for years. I think that. Um, you know, this committee has done all the work that we asked them to do in terms of, I've, let me go back. I don't know how long ago it was where we said as a committee, if we could make this happen, we wanted to make it happen. And we didn't vote for it because we felt like there were some unanswered questions. If you feel like some of the questions, are, if anybody feels that some of these questions aren't answered yet, then I think they should be put forward tonight so that we can get the answers to them. But. If our questions have been answered, I don't know what the purpose of delaying is. I think we've been hearing from the community for a very, very long time. And I think that if we're going to vote this in, the sooner we do it, the better, so that people can start planning. That having been said, I just want to raise one concern. And I alluded to it before. But right now, the committee was able to bring this proposal to us because we're no longer going to have high school busing next year. And we haven't even heard yet if um, the ALT is going to bring us a proposal that says if an override passes, then one of the things that you know, they're going to recommend is that we're going to put busing back in, and then what happens to this plan? There's no provision for that whatsoever. This is entirely riding on the fact that we're no longer going to do busing because we haven't figured out how we can afford busing and this change. Um, so I, I'm, I'm raising that as a, as a point because I think it's, you know, we. I don't think as a committee we've actually heard from the community about the fact that we're not going to have high school busing. I'm not sure as, as public as we think we've made it. I don't know if all the people who are affected by that change are really aware of it yet. So I don't see, personally, I don't see busing coming. If we don't have busing next year, I don't see it coming back because I don't think that if, I think if we have more money that that's probably not going to be where we put it back if we've gotten families to accommodate next year for no busing. I think we're probably going to stay with that. But I just I just want to raise it as as a potentially difficult issue out there. That's why I'm asking and that for those issues of whether or not now is to I would like to vote on it tonight if we can, but if those issues are important and obstructing, then I would like to move until June. Could, uh, could we have the superintendent address the issue? So the question of busing is right now our list of priorities, things we bring back with the successful override is not complete. However, I can tell you that on our most recent draft, we are looking to bring the busing back to the high school if the override passes. Yes. However, I do think that this plan is workable even with busing brought back to the high school. 
you elaborate on that? Sure. I'd be thrilled to hear anything about that. Well, if you look at the schedule <laughs> that they've proposed, the morning busing would work. The afternoon busing as it's current, oh, I can't find it right now, but I've looked at it enough to know. Uh, the morning busing would work, the afternoon busing as we do it right now wouldn't work, but we could create a solution to transport the few students who do take the bus home. We could have a hub system <laughs> take the kids to JFK. But only in the <laughs> afternoon, not in the morning. You know that killed me, Howard. Yeah. <laughs> so w with your s making that statement and feeling assured that we would be able to work this through, I am totally in favor of supporting this and voting on it tonight. I just quickly scanned through our current collective bargaining agreement. I just want to know something in case I'm missing it. Are teachers contractually obligated to provide help time after school? Because, because I'm looking and their service is from 10 minutes prior to five minutes after. That's what's in the collective bargaining agreement. So they're not, so I know they do it because they're professionals, because they love teaching and it's part of what they do. But what's making me uncomfortable is that um, I was a high school teacher with two kids who got off the bus at 3.35 and my help time with my students lasted until I could drive at a safe speed from Turners Falls to meet my kids as they got off the bus. So I'm looking, and I guess that's why my question about did you inquire of these people? Because I don't know from looking at the survey data whether these are dentist appointments that might be rescheduled or whether this is a second job which teachers do work second jobs, um, or whether this is something that can't, like an elementary school student getting off the bus, which can't be changed very easily, which would cause them to incur significant additional cost. I'm not saying that that necessarily would decide my vote, but that's why I will vote no tonight, because I don't, without that information, a very, very important people in our system, I don't want to vote for this. And I, I just don't, I don't think, I know that there's a tremendous amount of work done, but if you take the survey and you see the response rates as high as they are, 54%, the majority non-school related after school commitments, 48% help, 48% said help time for students, but I have no idea what that means. Does that mean they would do more? Does that mean they would do none? Does that mean, and so without, I'd, I'd like to get a handle on that information and, and I'll talk to high school teachers if they're willing to talk to me about how it would affect them. And if it's not going to affect them negatively, then I'll be happy to vote for it in June. Are there other comments? Mr. Moore. Yeah, you know, I, I think it will all depend on whether or not people are willing to um, go to work at the current time they currently go to work right now. If they're willing to go to work at the time they currently go to work right now, do their help time, what will then be before school, they will actually be working the same exact day they currently work in terms of the beginning and end of their day and providing just as much help time. So really, you know, <laughs> that's, that's the answer, is that if they're willing to work the hours they currently work, they, they don't have, they don't, they don't have, their door-to-door their -door time schedule wouldn't change at all. If they're not willing to do that, if, they, if, they, if basically they, you know, insist upon making it not work, well, they can make it not work, um, but that's, you, you know, all I can say is if you if they're willing to go to work at 7.15 now, which they are contractually obligated to do right now, if instead they choose to do work exactly by contract and then insist on doing their extra uncompensated work after school, then it will be later. But if they wish to do it during the same exact door-to-door -door time as they follow right now, it will be the same exact door-to-door -door time they follow right now. I, I think, though, that just um, Mr. Shelfo said earlier was that the students are in the building at the end of the day now, and there is a period of help time that they can access. What we're now saying, and now what we're saying is that we would like the majority of students not to be in the building at 7:30. That's right because we want them to be sleeping. You said, you know, we. Again, the counter is that well, only some of the kids would need to come in on some of the days. 
But if your if your solution to the problem of, of teachers not being available later than 240 is that all of them will just work the same day, that means that what you're saying is help time will now shift to the morning when we don't want the majority, right, in making this policy, when we don't want the majority of them to be there. They won't be there. Because they and aren't that, there after have, school. That, but that, how will that not have a significant <laughs> impact on additional They aren't in help time health. after school. The majority of them are not in help time after school either. The classrooms are not full after school. And we're talking about two days a week, I believe, that they are asked. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it really is just additional. It's not, you know, anything else. It's total hours of sleep. It's not, not hours, you know. It, 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 do you see what I'm saying? The, the classrooms aren't right. filled in the afternoon after school. It's not the majority of the classes because they we look they would look full because right now they have like 35 kids in them. They would look full with half of them in there. They aren't. They don't look full except for again the robotics classroom is always looking full. But that's because those kids are working 24 hours a day forever. We're not going to help their sleep issue. Okay. Um, the, and, and, and so on with the theater shops and everything else. Those kids, we're not going to help their sleep because they're working 24 hours a day. <coughs> They'll still sleep in. Well, yeah, but when a show is coming on, they're not going to sleep for that week anyhow. Yeah. And this is not going to affect that. I think it's, it's, the other thing that's interesting is if we do get busing back, that would mean there would be a busload of kids arriving at, uh, what is it, 7.05, roughly. No, that's not yeah. my plan. That's not your plan? Okay. That would be one of the ways it could happen. Anyway, um, so. Okay. Other, um, other comments or questions regarding the motion that's on the table? Uh, Ms. Minnick. Only peripherally, but uh, you just said something. You just said it's about, the, it's about the number of hours of sleep. So have I missed the point of a lot of this talk? Because all along I've been hearing that it's not just the hours of sleep, it's when they sleep. Right. And it's the circadian rhythm. Right. And it's that we need to be moving it, shifting it, because they s go to sleep later and they wake right. up Right, that's later. why starting later. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about the number of hours of sleep. So to Downey's point and to Andrew's point, it really is about they shouldn't have to get up and come in and do extra help before school because so, that cuts into not just the number of hours of sleep, it really does change what time they have to get up and we're trying to make them get up later. Right, right. So if we leave it the way it is, all 900 have to be at school at 730. If we move it to 815, far less than that will have to be at school at 730. I okay. don't dispute that, but there are some kids, you're, you're right. And they may it's still the, do it at so, night. So after. we're doing what's right for the greater number of people, we which is what the Andrew said the of <laughs> from the very beginning. Didn't I hear you say the words is for the greater good? Something so, like that, yeah. 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 Well, so they're, they're all, everybody is good because very few people do an hour a day of extra help time with a teacher every single day of the year. Very few students do that. Few teachers are there. Okay. So, uh, I have one more. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, I think there's, there's, there's great stuff in here. This, this is a very thorough document. The one thing that troubles me is the, the shaving of the minutes. And I know that we could say, well, a minute here, a minute there, doesn't matter. And embedded in here is also the suggestion that if the school day can't be shortened, that it could go from an 810 to a 240. Mm -hmm. You know, which, and, and I, so, that is is seen how swapping the time between classes also taking that away too and just taking away those extra four minutes of um, of class time both. because if you didn't do both you could have it you could just lose you know you could go eight ten to two thirty still yeah, I, I, as I said earlier I think passing time there's value to passing time there's what value to passing time. It's not like lunchtime. They don't get that anymore. Most teachers <laughs> Ms. Minnick. Uh, just, just one final thing. Um, I would feel, despite the superintendent's reassurance that he thinks that even if we restore busing that we could still make this work, I'd really like to see that plan. I don't, uh, you know, I, I trust him almost implicitly, but I really would like to see what the effects are going to be for you know how it how it's going to look so I would far far prefer to be ha making this decision in a month okay. 
Okay, so there's been a motion uh, that's been made and seconded uh, to um, uh, I believe adopt the recommendations of the of the committee. Of the yes, sir. committee. Um, is there any other point of order? Could I just ask you? I mean, if if the majority of the committee members vote against uh, in favor of this this evening, then there could be minority reconsideration of it brought to the next meeting. But mm -hmm. if the majority of people vote it down this evening, will it still come back to us in yeah, June? That or my question. It, will it, it be can. defeated, in which case the minority would be the people who voted for it? And could they not seek minority reconsideration? They could. Um, I or can I not make a motion if it doesn't do that? We just I'm do just it next month because that was that was Alden's original concern, and it is my concern as well. I hate to see. I don't want to see us vote no tonight and have a lot of people think that it's because we don't care, or that. And and I want to be sure. I, I really would prefer this for next month. I, I just. Okay. So. Um, so just to be clear, your rules do allow for minority reconsideration uh, if something fails on a vote, and so presumably that would work for the proponents or the opponents. So, um, Take it right back. yeah, so it could be brought back. Um, did you have a question or comment? Okay. Okay. So then I will. Um, uh, why don't I ask the clerk to call the roll, just because this could be a close vote. And how are we working? Do you want to start by reading the motion <laughs> for everybody <laughs> first, and then we'll vote and do a roll call? The motion on the table that was seconded. This no, the one that's right now. This month. For the start time to be later. And it's the understanding that this would take effect as of September of this year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, sorry, just so I'm clear, even if we vote, no tonight. It means we could still vote yes in June. Okay. It could certainly be brought back. I'll bring it right back. So, Lord, do you have the motion on the table that Blue made and Stephanie seconded? Yes. To approve the proposal for the high school late start tonight. Can you just read what the wording is that you have? Can you give us some wording? <laughs> <laughs> By the committee, yeah, yeah. by the, yeah. Okay, so um, so then I would ask the clerk to call the roll uh, on this vote. <coughs> yes. No. Yes. No. 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 Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. No. Mr. No. Okay, so the motion does not carry. Uh, Can I make a motion to bring it back and vote next month on this in June? To bring it back as people have requested. Can I make a motion so that it gets on the agenda for June? Uh, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. <laughs> sure. I'd like to make That's a motion. That's perfectly appropriate. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion that um, in the, at the next meeting in June that we vote on the recommendation from the start the start time ad hoc committee. Okay. Second. Okay. So th uh, the motion now before you is to uh, effectively do what we just did a month from now. Uh, so um, is there any discussion about that motion? Yes, I would like to encourage school committee members who voted no tonight, if uh, whatever questions and concerns you have, to please try to get them addressed by next time so that we can vote. Because if we're going to, if we are going to pass this, and I hope that we will, um, that we have as much planning time as possible for, for families and staff. And I also would like to, um, to, to further that and state that if there are any questions that they're probably free to contact Lucy Hartree as the chair of the, um, <laughs> or they can contact Howard or myself or anyone else. Um, so answer the questions prior to June if there's anything that they can't get answered by themselves. Okay. 
Thank you. So um, all those in favor of the current motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that motion carries and the, uh, this uh, item will return at your next meeting in June. Um, okay, the next item on the agenda is the District Improvement Plan 2013-2015. Um, I will turn it over to the superintendent. Thank you. Uh, this is the District Improvement Plan, the final draft that I talked to you about and proposed to you in January. Uh, this plan was, is developed by the administrative leadership team and uh, confirms the core values of how we build our goals and build our budget, has our mission, our theory of action, and it's similar to the format from last year. At, uh, this year's plan has three strands. Um, first strand dedicated to students, second to faculty and staff, and third to technology. I'll briefly describe it for the people at home, but I'll have this posted on our website so everybody can see it. And I know that you have all seen this, um, and we went through it back in January. Uh, so under students, our plan to support students learning through instruction includes meeting students' social and emotional needs, using research evidence-based options for redesigning elementary classroom schedules uh, to promote family engagement district-wide, to use the predictive model in order to identify students at risk for academic difficulty and then to uh, support their learning, and also to use differentiated instruction to provide lessons in the common core. In faculty and staff, uh, we are looking to deepen and refine our focus on quality teaching. This includes creating a two-year calendar of professional development, having all teachers and ESPs trained and engaged in the professional learning community model, to have a structure in place for the pre-K-12 uh, curriculum alignment, to be in compliance with the DESE requirements, training staff to work with English language learners, to continue to uh, value uh, the respect for human differences as a district and apply that to student learning and have that reflected in teaching practices. And to use our data teams uh, to inform instruction on individual students, not just classroom or grade level students, but to really focus down on the individual. And also to develop uh, benchmark assess uh, assessments which are nearly finished. That's for uh, September 2014. And in our third strand on technology, um, to embed instructional technology into our everyday practice. Our three goals are to uh, ha continue our teacher-led professional development sessions, which is focused on small group learning in each building, um, to fully prepare to implement the park testing, which is something that we began thanks to the capital planning money that was given to us to um, prepare the infrastructure. And uh, also we'll have to train the teachers and uh, train the students on how to take that test online and finally to um, have a committee of teachers to develop a plan to align student learning objectives with state technology and skill frameworks so with this district improvement plan <coughs> i'm hoping that you'll vote uh, approval i think it's important to note that though i lead and facilitate the development of this plan this is in no way my plan this is our plan this is a plan developed by the principals, by the administrators that are on our team, and we put a lot of time and energy into developing this. This is the first step in our district improvement and school improvement process. So after we finished this and we talked about it in January, the principals went to work with their school councils to develop their school improvement plans, which takes this and implements it one step further. So I would ask for you to vote uh, approval of this two-year plan tonight. Approval um, of the district improvement plan as presented. Second. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded on the uh, district improvement plan. Are there any questions or comments about the uh, plan that's been put before us? I'd just like to comment that I, I'm I'm still having been on here long enough before we had a plan that looked like this. I'm still um, really appreciating how thorough and detailed and um, time specific this all is, so that. Um, when a new superintendent comes in that there is a clear plan with with timelines to follow and it just it, it it gives me hope that things can be a little bit more seamless than in previous transitions where people are kind of starting from scratch i just i just without acknowledging the specifics of what's in here um, um i just i want to acknowledge kind of the big picture of what that means for the district to have such a thorough plan thank you 
Thank you. I would just echo what Ms. Pick said and take it one step farther to cite, I won't cite the specifics, but talk about how it's very measurable by looking at percentage increases and it really gives a target for uh, movement forward. That's something that we're attainable. It's very measurable and not big at all. So uh, thank you for all your hard work and everybody's hard work in putting this together. Okay. Any other comments or questions before we take a vote on this? Okay. All those in favor then of approving the district improvement plan uh, for 2013 through 2015, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So the plan is approved. And now we'll move on to the school improvement plan presentations. And I believe the first is. Argy Ryan, Principal Argy Riddle. Argy Riddle, sorry, Argy <laughs> Ryan. It's, it's late. <laughs> I apologize. I'll take either one of those R's. <laughs> We're renaming you after the school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. Sounds great. It's all yes. <laughs> Principal Riddle, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I'm. You've received, I believe, by email, copies of. Um, the, our report of our plan that was that went for this past year and also the plan that we that we're proposing for the next two years correct and you've also got copies in front of you um, I just want to start by acknowledging um, that one of the greatest pleasures I think of being a school principal is working with the school council and the school council at um, Ryan Road School is incredible they're so much fun to work with they've got wonderful ideas they ask fabulous questions they really keep us um, at all at the school on our toes um, and just to acknowledge that they are parents Jason Berg Mary Curtin Tom Davidson and Rob McLaughlin and staff members Michelle Andrews Barbara Dillman Greg Kerstetter Diana Ramsden and me um, and Lisa Minnick keeps in really close touch with us by email and gives us wonderful suggestions. So you see the plan and um, I'm sure that you can <clears throat> understand it as written. Basically we have, we're proposing three goals which are similar to the goals that we've had before because we thought they were important ones and we didn't feel like we had completely finished our work. The first one involves um, implementing the new Massachusetts 2011 frameworks in English language arts and math and using our new teacher evaluation system to make sure that that's being put in place. I can tell you that um, I feel the school is well on its way to implementing the new teacher evaluation plan. 100% of the staff, we were required to um, have 50% of the staff, the teachers professional staff involved and 100 percent are involved and so I feel like we're working our way through the system I'm having my end of year conferences with the teachers right now they're presenting their artifacts and their portfolios to me and we're all finding it to be a really enjoyable interesting learning process so I think that part of it is pretty well established we don't feel that we've got the new curriculum frameworks totally in place better in math than in English language arts. Math we feel pretty confident about. English language arts still needs some work. The second goal has to do with um, differentiation, essentially putting the practices in place um, that ensure that we are meeting the needs of all of our students through um, inclusion of special education and our Title I services in the classroom through implementing the SST, the student support team process, through tiered instruction, through academic choice, um, and those different ways of approaching differentiation, but starting, of course, with fidelity to the curriculum frameworks in classroom instruction for everybody. We're still working on those things. A lot of them are the same as they've been before. Um, we feel like we're making really good progress. We made references to the parts of the district improvement plan that apply to the things that we're working on. And it's interesting that our third goal, every time our staff looks at this or our school council looks at it, they say, now that's the one that's really describing our school. That's really our school. So number three is about creating a welcoming and inclusive learning community for all our students and their families. Um, 
And we're talking about healthy eating, healthy lifestyles, making sure that all of our families feel included through regular events at least once a month that honor the cultures of our families, um, making sure that our kids participate in community <coughs> service. And of course, the thing that is really important to us and that is furthering our understanding of responsive classroom. We think responsive classroom is an incredibly positive community building aspect of our school, but what we've learned about it is you don't just learn it and then do it. You have to keep going deeper, going deeper, going deeper. And it's interesting that around this time of the year, each year, I start hearing around the school, well, next year, this is the part that we have to look at. So for instance, we've developed um, support systems for our substitute teachers, who we call guest teachers, when they come into the building so they'll know exactly how to interact with the students. That's one thing we've done. We've worked with parents. Um, we've brought uh, our ESPs, our support staff, together with teachers to deepen their understanding of responsive classroom. It goes on and on. So that's a really important part of this. And that's my five minutes. So now, if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Are there questions about the Ryan Road School? Only to say thank you very much, and um, it's with a, a heavy heart that I acknowledge that this will be the last one you'll deliver to us uh, uh, this year. <coughs> I'm sure there'll be time to thank you for your many years of service at Ryan. Thanks. Road and in the district. Thank you. Um, and I, I should also say that we, we did prepare a two-year plan with the understanding that Sarah Madden will be joining the school as the new principal um, starting July 1st. And of course, it would be my understanding, and I'm sure yours as well, that she would take that plan and adjust it as, as seems fit as time goes by, but at least that gives her a framework to start with. So she has something rather than nothing. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you Marie. Thank you, Principal Riddle. Okay, um, next up is uh, uh, Principal Joseph Smith from Leeds Elementary. Good evening, school committee members. Thank you for this opportunity for allowing me to share my uh, Leeds School Improvement Plan. Uh, it's been a long night. <laughs> Let's talk about sleep. Uh, it made me sleepy, so uh, I hope I can stay awake. I assume that you had an opportunity to look at the document, look it over. Um, so there's a few things I want to point out to you before we get into it. The first thing is that the theory of action is the same as the one in 2011 to 2012 school improvement plan. The second thing to notice is that the, the percentage of students in goal one has been adjusted to reflect the performance in students based on the last MCAS exam. Um, also, the third thing is that if you notice, there are outcomes and there are preparations for success in the document. The outcomes represent initiatives or actions that already have been taking place, and the preparations for success are things to come for school year uh, 2013 to 2014. And finally, while these are four goals that will address the uh, school year 13 SIP, there has been a number of initiatives that target improvement, improving student performance, and that will continue, such as the uh, Smith College Ames program collaboration will continue with the chemistry students, uh, with the Leeds um, K through five students and teachers, and that will run through 2015. Also, the Hitchcock Center will continue their Nature's Hand-On Science program uh, from 2013 to 2015. Teachers will receive embedded professional development on how to facilitate rigorous hands-on science inquiry. Also, the Leeds AM tutoring program will have before school bus service. So they'll have AM bus service to support the students of low income, uh, the Meadowbrook apartment, so they can get there and be participatory, because that's the demographic that's missing in the AM uh, tutoring program. So I want to make sure that that is solidified before I leave. Uh, teachers will continue to collaborate using the peer observation model to improve their practice. And finally, the lead school council will continue to discuss the implementation of a pilot program for departmentalization. And with that being said, the LEAD School Improvement Plan, like I said, as you can see, it has outcomes and it has a preparation for success, 
The first goal, the percentage of students in grades three to five scoring on proficiency higher in math will increase from 48% to 75% as measured by the MCAS administered in March 2013. And I'm not gonna read through all of the outcomes, the things that we have practiced, not to put you to sleep, uh, but it's there, and the preparations for success will be 100% of the classroom teachers in grades two to five will share sample MCAS open response results to students illustrating uh, the use of rubrics and student exemplars. Also, 100% of the special ed teachers, Title I teachers and classroom teachers will create math, math walls and math rubrics um, for their students to reference in the classrooms. If you move on to uh, goal number two, this pertains to the non-professional uh, teachers and we had this goal as a goal last year but I felt like I wanted to, we felt like we needed to continue it. And so we expanded a little bit on it and what we're gonna do is have non-professional teachers uh, be mentored by the math coaches at Leeds. And we have three of them taught underneath uh, Margie's tutelage and they'll be working with all the non-professional staff to make sure that they have a deepened understanding of the math curriculum. Um, and some of the preparations for success will be over the course of two years, 2012, 2014, non-professional teachers will meet a minimum of, minimum of twice a year, excuse me, twice per month for individual supervisory meetings with the principal to discuss the professional growth plans and their uh, t evaluation plans. Also, during the summer of 2013, 100% of the Leeds Elementary School teachers will be offered mathematics professional development, the DMI, development, developing mathematical ideas, will be offered to all teachers at no cost and that will be coming through the uh, Clark School funds. Goal three is about our technology and uh, I'm very proud to say that the family stakeholders in the Leeds community have been very um, aggressively supporting uh, the Leeds community with professional development. So I have a number of uh, businessmen and businesswomen who have been participatory in pre presenting their uh, expertise with how to use smart boards, how to use uh, document cameras, and so forth. I've also had the pleasure of having Angelo be part of that process. And as a result, if you look at outcomes B, the percentage of faculty who use technology in the practice will increase from 70 to 80 percent as measured by sign up as a media specialist and teacher survey has happened. So we have met that criteria, that goal. Um, also, um, so there's no preparations for success because we felt like that goal has been, has, been, has been met, essentially. And one thing I might add that hasn't been mentioned, um, all of the classrooms have whiteboards and they will have document cameras by the end of the summer. And finally, it was this lead school council that decided that we need to have a goal that addressed the student's social emotional needs. So as a result, we created a master schedule that support teachers to implement morning meetings. We also each month have Leeds school community meetings where we have Clark School and other parents come in and be participatory with our meetings. And we also um, are going to hire, uh, hire an interventionist to support the students who are struggling with social emotional behaviors. Um, and my goal is to send 100% of all the teachers to responsive classroom training. Last year I sent 10 and so far I have four that signed up, but there's also a competition to uh, go to the DMI uh, training. So parents do wanna, excuse me, teachers do wanna try and organize their summers effectively and not be in school too much. So that is my presentation. If you have any questions, I'll take those. Thank you. Are there any questions for uh, Principal Smith about the uh, Leeds School Improvement Plan? I just have one question. Um, you stated that the goal was already met. Um, Technology. Right. When, so it's not looking at what's going to be met. It, it, this, that part of it was what already happened. If you look at the outcomes for goal number three, um, there are one, two, three, four, five things, significant things that, are, that has happened. Mm -hmm. One of those things is uh, we have Study Island, which is a web-based um, software where teach, teachers and students can access from home to help increase their uh, mathematical and their um, ELA capacity. So there's a lot of things that we have done. I felt like that goal has been met 
And I really want to turn my attention to the other three goals, especially the social emotional goal. Well, I understand, I, and I think that that's very admirable, and I, and I, I think that's wonderful, especially with um, looking into responsive classroom and hopefully getting. I've seen how how it works wonderfully out at Ryan Road and and, then, and at home. I mean, it's just it's just nice, a respectful way to t um, treat kids. I just um, with it, and it's just me. School improvement plan. I was thinking of things that we were looking ahead. So I was, <coughs> was this a goal that you had already had and that you met, and that's why we put it here? Or yes, that's correct. This goal okay. started in 2011, actually. Okay, great. When we had just one smart board. So that's pretty good. Before you got into this plan, you talked about one of the um, uh, focus for the coming year was about um, departmentalization. Yes. Can, can you say what, more about what that meant? What I meant by departmentalization or the pilot? Or both? Yes. <laughs> both? <laughs> yeah. Right. So departmentalization refers to the systematic um, expertise of one teacher teaching one course subject area versus teaching a slew of subjects. So me as a classroom teacher has the, the arduous task of having to teach ELA, math, science, yada, 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 yada. Given, first of all, it's a very antiquated model in my estimation, and in my humble estimation. Uh, when I looked at other uh, schools, like the Norris School, uh, Reading, and uh, the East, Eastern part of the state, and other schools I visited, I noticed that high-performance schools have this model where teachers specialize in core subjects. It's less tedious on a teacher. They become an expert in a particular core subject. And so something that I thought we might want to explore is given the woes of most districts in terms of budgetary uh, lacking or funding, um, it might be a good thing to know that I can't send a good teacher to get math training, science training, social studies training. But if I can get a teacher to specialize in one particular area at a grade level, I think that those students would benefit immensely. So, so we want to pilot that and see if that's true. I know it's true in other schools. So I know when, when my kids went through Leeds, um, that was a while ago, so I know that in the fifth grade in particular, the teachers were, were doing that. They, they would have their, all the kids would go to one teacher for science and one for math and one for um, history, I think it was, and they all did language arts. So are you talking about looking at that school-wide across all the grades? What I'm looking at doing is a pilot. Well, I won't be here. <laughs> well, what I'm hoping will happen, my hope is that there'll be at least a pilot to investigate the efficacy in this uh, model. Because uh, like I said, um, one teacher doing all core subjects of being very um, knowledgeable or an expert in all those subjects is pretty, it's not a big demand on teachers, I think. And so, um, in all fairness to them, I think that teachers would be better if they're teaching something that they're passionate about. I know that me as a special ed teacher and as a uh, reading teacher, I was very passionate about reading. So science, I cared about a lot. Math, yeah, but I really loved reading. So that's, that was my passion. And I think that my students benefit immensely from my reading expertise. I can just, um, just to kind of jump in, because I, I taught in a classroom like that. I taught just math and science and social mm -hmm. studies, and I shared a class um, with another one who did ELA. And we found it just extraordinarily helpful. Um, in terms of planning time, I was able to refine lessons because I was teaching double everything I was doing. Um, I had another partner to bounce ideas off about students, so we had concerns about a particular student. Um, we could talk and have a dialogue about that. Um, there were so many benefits. Some of the drawbacks were parent-teacher conferences because we had 40 instead of 20. But it, um, for me and for my colleague, it was a really powerful experience, and it was something that had I stayed in the classroom, I would have uh, maintained that. As, uh, as a way. It doesn't work for everyone. I mean, there's, there's things that people have to finesse because it is, it's a partnership, but it's something that I think a pilot seems very um, interesting to, to explore and it, it could be beneficial. When I went to elementary school here, um, I went to Florence Grammar School, but we had that. We had, um, so somehow it shifted back away from that because we had that. We had science teacher and, and we moved around during the day in fifth grade. <coughs> Yes, Mr. Moore. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, how does this uh, how does this work with the idea of integrating a curriculum where you're teaching multiple subjects at once? Is it is that is that taken into account? Before the answer, the integration doesn't go anywhere. The integration is naturally there. It's just a matter of being aware of it. So you can't have math without having science because math is a science, for instance. 
And you can't study reading without having math or science embedded in it. It's just natural that it's there. It's just a matter of uh, highlighting that. So it doesn't, no, it doesn't interfere with integration at all. And technology is so much more integrated at this point now when you have departmentalization. You can do more with the technology, I think. So when we went to go visit the Nara School, for instance, um, my teachers were blown away with it. They loved it. And so I just think that they need some leadership that's going to carry them in that direction. If I may add in, there are variations of this going on in our district right now. Um, it's a strategy we put in place at Bridge Street in the fourth grade. And at Jackson Street, they have what's called mix it up math so that the kids go to a different teacher. And you know, it, it's something that um, is a positive trend in education and of course anytime there's a pilot you look at your current data you have your baseline data and you look at it and make sure that what you're doing is improving instruction improving student learning so I think a pilot gives us an opportunity to do just that which builds on the data teams that we've established in our schools are there any other questions or comments for well just just the fact that somewhere it disappeared because I mean I did that years ago so at some point they changed it and took it out <laughs> That's education. Yeah. <laughs> back and forth. That's how. Now it's back. <laughs> Pendulum back. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, thank you. Principal Smith. We appreciate the report. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next uh, presentation is uh, Principal Athis and the NHS School Improvement Plan. Good evening. I just wanted to open up with, um, I don't know if the Brian said anything about it, but we had the school day Olympics at NHS today, and it was it was a great day. Uh, we had a variety of um, school districts that came, and it really was heartwarming and heartfelt. And I know he's probably not watching, but AJ Strack won the show. He sang a version of the national anthem that was it was like an angel. So um, it, it was great. A lot of our students volunteered, and staff volunteered. So it was a good day had by all. So my district improve, uh, school improvement plan focuses in on the achieve, closing the achievement gap, technology, and the further development of our advisor advisee program. So what I would like to do is go over um, the successes that we had this year and where I think that we can use some work. So one of my goals, which I knew was lofty, was I said that 100% of the sophomore class will participate in PSAT testing in 2012 and 2013. The PSA test is a direct link indicator of SAT scores and also college readiness and also it identifies students who otherwise wouldn't take an AP class <clears throat> that they have the potential to do it. So what happens is, is all of the sophomores, I want to take it, this year 190 tested out of 218 which was about 88 percent. What happens after that is guidance counselors meet with these students and go over the results and the college, college board gives each student a booklet that looks like this, Reach Your College Goals. And in the booklet, you can see correct answers and explanations, get a personalized SAT study plan, search for colleges, explore majors and careers, learn about scholarship programs, and take a personality <coughs> test. And when the student opens it up, it shows where your skill area is, your strengths and your weaknesses. It also shows you the correct answers to the test. So it's a lot of information um, in the assessment. So, I would like to continue to do that and again I don't even think for next year I would change the hundred percent because I think that's although a lofty goal it's it's um, it could be doable um, my two percent increase in student attendance from 95 percent to 97 percent I really won't be able to comment on that until the end of the year reports are in from the state uh, again 95 is a state average uh, I looked at it for next year and I put in 96 because as you get up that high with percentage wise with attendance it's very difficult to move to the next level. And the third was to increase the number of students entering the ninth grade in honors English classes from 69 percent to 72 percent in order to improve student achievement. As you know we worked with the middle school collaboratively this year in the math area <clears throat> and I'm happy to report as you know I believe that uh, Ms. Wilson came and gave uh, an update on the math at the middle school. And so we modeled off of that and um, we had our English department come together. And, and English is one of the few only course, except if you take an algebra or geometry, where there's um, leveling. And so there's a standard English and there's an honors English one. So our 
English uh, teachers got together and worked on it. And this year, we're going to model after our history class, modern history, and we're going to have the honors included with the uh, standard English. And um, they're excited about it. They've been working on curriculum. They're aligning it with the Common Core, and I think it will be a very positive thing. To date, our students have signed up for classes. There's 133 in Honors English and 90 in Standard English, and they will be um, in smaller groups, smaller class sizes, but they will be um, heterogeneously grouped. The Honors students will be offered um, other assignments uh, to get the Honors credit for the class. English and sophomore year remain standard and um, honors English separately as they move into the AP areas. In the technology area, before I leave that, I just want to say two things. In math, we are modeling after um, middle school. We are coming over to the middle school to give eighth graders tests to see if um, some of them can uh, test out of 1A at our high school. And Lisa, we're starting a capstone project for seniors, second semester, um, senior year, and it's going to be community service oriented, so it's going to have your <laughs> name on it. Came true. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in the technology area, and I, I, I want to just say, as Joseph said, and I know, Angelo, you're sitting here, it's been a pleasure to work with Angelo. You have no idea how far we've come this year. It's been awesome. And um, even, I mean, Google Chrome, as simple as that is, I, I have to tell you. <laughs> so. Um, Anyway, so looking at the technology, 100% um, of the faculty using the same grading system. And as you know, uh, this year my teachers all used N grade, or most of them used N grade. And I think that if, as parents um, on the committee, you know that you can track um, what they're doing, what they owe. And believe it or not, the kids are awesome about it. They really, they look to see what they owe. It's good for the teachers, um, learning strategies. If students have work to do, the teachers just can go right on and pick, you know, so it, it saves so much time. Um, I won't be here to see it, but I can't imagine, I've worked with PowerSchool with a new um, information system, what the capabilities are um, going to be. So um, we have been giving our staff professional development days. Gabby Harrington has been offering some professional development. Angelo's offered a lot of professional development. Uh, what I like about it is it's not just put in, it's followed, there's follow through with it and there's explanations. And um, <clears throat> I was in the computer lab the other day doing a walkthrough and one of the teachers said, look at this and we've been trying for a long time to get insight onto the computers in the lab where the teachers can watch what the kids are doing and you know like write messages like go back to your assignment etc and it's on the com it's in the computer lab so um, we're excited about that the PTO I can't say enough about them they are have been along with the district our technology base they um, raise money every school year they donate money um, and we put it right into technology. This year we brought document cameras. Um, most all teachers have the LCD projectors mounted. Um, we try to do a little bit uh, every year. There's Mimeos also and smart boards. Um, increasing the number of online and credit recovery classes. We are very successful with that. We bought into a program called Education 2020 and believe it or not it's already changed its name and I don't know what it is. So. Um, we are offering five courses this semester. We have 14 students that are signed up for them. They're marketing, MCAS math, human geography, communications, biology. And I'm looking into summer school to see if we can get some mini courses for kids to take um, over the summer, summer. They really seem to like it and they like the pace where they don't have to, um, you know, there's not a teacher standing in front of them. They can do it at their, their own pace and it's also very good for the credit recovery. And engaging 85% of the students in classroom technology instruction, that is a work in progress. And the way that I can measure that is through walkthroughs and um, teacher evaluation. And this year we are going to offer two computer science classes. And it really is, it speaks to a need at the high school. They both filled up immediately. Um, and another computer design class that we're offering filled up immediately. So um, we're excited about that. Let's see. Uh, we also have AP US History online. One student wasn't able to get into AP US History last year because of scheduling conflict and he took AP US History. 
In number three, in our advisories, the second year into the advisories, um, we did not do a pre-assessment, but at the end of this advisory season, we are going to do a post-assessment and um, ask the students if they feel more connected to the high school and find out some other things from the advisory. This year, the staff at NHS developed professional learning communities. We had a data community, an advisory planning community, tiered instruction, a homework, healthy living committee, professional development, and scheduling. And I bring them up because uh, we also had a new student government leadership team, which was a direct result of NEASC, where kids wanted more of a voice. So. Um, they formed it this year and they did an excellent job and one of the things they studied was homework and they collaborated with our, our advisory committee uh, to talk about it in the professional learning community. So we're trying to interconnect all that we do to provide um, meaningful feedback. Um, we continue to provide professional development to staff. But what happened after the first year, we had a lot of professional development for staff in, in the advisories, and they, um, they asked that it could be voluntary for this coming year. So what Allison and Deb, who were the NEF grant, they received the big NEF grant, they came to our school on Wednesdays prior to the advisory on Friday, and they modeled for teachers that needed, um, that felt that they would like some help with it. Uh, the peer advisory we did not do because it got to the end of the summer and it was just and it was costly and um, it was just going to be a yeoman's amount of work so we decided that at the end of this year we would get a peer leader in each group and then go forward from there. We wanted to make sure that the advisory seeing that it was a second year in fact we spent time on that and not on something else and then the, the, the big piece would not materialize. And as far as the discipline piece and it, until we get to the end of the year, I won't know too much about that because um, we have to collect some data from the DESE site and also from our own records. Um, we had a good year with advisories. We had a, uh, setting the tone was one of the advisories. Uh, that's group norms. We showed a movie to the entire school, Girl Rising, which is a powerful documentary about nine girls born into poverty and highlights the power of education. And then we discussed it in the advisory that followed. Um, academic <coughs> integrity is always a big one. We were fortunate with the presidential election. We were able to have meaningful discussion about that. And so all in all, um, it was a good year for the advisories. I agree with Margie and Joseph that my predecessor will, or successor, <laughs> will, will develop a plan for next year. I did make some changes that I will share with whoever that is. Um, and so do you have any questions? I hope I didn't rush, but I know it's late in your. Any questions for principal? Nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just like to say to you and publicly, thank you. Um, I've had a wonderful experience in Northampton, and I probably won't be at school committee anymore. But it's been a pleasure to work with all of you, and you have a great school system. And I love Northampton High School. The the fact I always say you can be who you want to be and the kids that you have in there and the staff it's just it's incredible and the community support is even better so thank you thank you we thank you and mr. Smith for all that you've done for yes. Northampton public schools thank you very much okay thank you principals please go home and get some sleep <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, next up uh, we have a presentation uh, NPS technology plan, Angelo Rota. Hopefully you all have a copy of this in front of you uh, in color because there are some charts that I'll refer to that will be much more uh, applicable to what I'll be talking about if you can see them in different colors. Um, first off, uh, this document is brand new. Um, I looked at the old technology plan. I had all of my uh, technology integration specialists look at what we had. Uh, Gabriel Richard Harrington, who's at the high school, uh, Molly McLaughlin, who's at the middle school, Andrea Marks, who's at the elementary school, and John Crescitelli, 
who you know uh, is a computer teacher at the middle school, and the one word that came out was verbiage. Uh, there was an awful lot of it. So our goal was to condense, make it very easy to read, make it understandable, show where we are, where we're going, what we hope to accomplish. And you'll notice uh, across each page, living document because as you know, especially in technology, it's changing so rapidly that you can't just say, okay, we've got the tech plan done and you put it on a shelf and you don't have to worry about it. So um, this is an ongoing process that we're revisiting monthly uh, as we change this. And again, uh, a great impetus for this is because we have to file it with DESE uh, and also to validate our E-rate plan so that we're eligible for E-rate funding. So you have to have a, uh, preferably a living document and something on file with the Department of Education so that you can also fulfill your E-rate requirements. Uh, the first part, um, just a little background on the Northampton community. And the old one was very intense. It had a lot of information in there. I kind of cut it down to just give an overview. Uh, definition of terms, what's it, what is technology? Technology can be a pen. I mean, anything that works as a tool for you can be technology. It could be a smart board, but it also could be just a pen. Um, this evening, uh, Superintendent Salzer spoke about the district improvement goals. Uh, since this plan goes from 2013 to 2015, which is according to DESE uh, regulation that your tech plan goes for a period of three years, um, I included the district improvement goals from 2012 to 2013, which are already accomplished in most part. And you can see in the left column on the third page uh, what the goals were and how we fared. How did we do? Did we meet those goals? Where did we fall short? Uh, why did we fall short? How did we do well on them? And then as uh, was presented just a little while ago, the district improvement plan for 2013 and 2014. So that's the next section. Uh, what are the goals and how we need to fare? What do we need to do? What do we need to continue doing well? What have, where have we fallen short and we gotta make up some ground there? And so we've looked at where we've been again, where we are now and looking forward to the next year. Um, at the bottom of the fourth page, not only do we need to fare and what do we need to do, but we have to be clear about outcomes. What do we want to accomplish and how do we plan on accomplishing them? How do we collaborate? This is a collaborative effort. Um, we meet again regularly so that we discuss where we are, where we're going, what are the needs at the different schools. And monitoring and measuring performance, because again, that came up earlier. How do you know your program's doing well? How do you validate it? Well, you have to look at where you were and what's going on now, and are you seeing any tangible results? And then finally, we have to become accountable for progress and results every step of the way. So it's nice that People's Bank comes in and donates uh, $5,000 to us so we can use that for technology, but who's gonna get it and why are they gonna get it? You know, in, in my experience, I've worked with teachers who say, well, I want a smart board, it'll make my job easier. Well, it doesn't. It makes it more demanding because you have to become much more creative, much more uh, in tune with technology and current trends and in instruction. So um, these are important things. We have to become accountable and it's nice to get equipment, it's ni nice to get donations, but who's going to use it? What's their reason for being? Why do they want to use it? And I need that justification from staff to say I want a projector. Well, what do you want to do with it? Well, I want to be able to show multimedia. I want to be able to use a document camera to show kids work. Why is this a four on MCAS? Why is this a good uh, composition? Well, because look at what they did. They don't have to run down the hall. They don't have to make copies. They don't have to make overhead transparencies. There's immediate results. And so these are important things that change your instruction and validate why we're getting the money so we can go to these businesses as Brian and I have done this year and be able to show not only the tool but show how well our students in Northampton do. And it's very, very impressive to businesses to say, we, didn't, we had no idea that students were doing this kind of work and 
performing at this level. And so that was a great incentive to them to say, we're not just giving money, we know it's going to be used wisely, we know technology is growing and <coughs> moving ahead. So that's been very helpful. The next section of the document uh, focuses on levels of progress. And there are, the legend is that if it's green, we're at an acceptable level. If it's yellow, it needs improvement. And if it's red, we're underperforming. And again, we all sat down, we all looked at this, and we were very honest. We didn't try to cover up anything and say, oh yeah, we're doing really great and everything's wonderful. We looked at things, for instance, on the first uh, row of that table, focus area, impact of technology on the teacher role, mostly teacher-centered lectures, minimal student use of technology and instruction. Unfortunately, that's the most common thing we have in our district. That's not to say that our instruction is poor. It's not. Instruction is excellent. But as far as looking at it from a technological point of view and how technology is used, we could improve that a great deal. Okay? So we looked at these things, not to be critical that we're not doing great things in the classroom, because obviously we look at our school results and our SAT scores and our AP exam results, and we know we're doing a great job, but how is technology fitting into that? How are we moving forward into the 21st century? As Andrea Marks always makes me laugh, she says, before it's over. <laughs> so we want to get there before it's over. So that's, uh, you know, what our, our focus is. And so I went through this, as you can see, uh, using this rubric. Is it early technology, meaning is it just beginning? Are we just finding our way into developing technology? We're making good use of it. We can see we're moving ahead into proficient technology, which is what standards and best practices are all about, and then into advanced technology, where you've got those people who are really way out on the cutting edge. Uh, if you go to, into some of the chemistry classes at Northampton High School, the technology, they've got an Apple TV on the wall, they've got an iPad, they're doing experiments, they're interacting, they're doing things on the web. I mean, they're, they're at that cutting edge, they're way out there. Um, they even have a program where the kids do the bubble sheets and they hold it up to the computer and the, com the camera built into the computer grades the paper right there so the kids can see their results. They don't even have to go to the Scantron. It's beyond that. And it's all web-based. So it's fantastic stuff. Uh, so again, I went through the table, I looked at things, and then as we get down to t uh, staff, technology integration specialist, we're proficient there. Budget levels, I'm happy to say that our budget's been very stable. And it's been stable, thank you to Superintendent Salzer for this year and looking forward to next year, that we didn't sustain cuts. And we were able to get help from the city, thanks to the mayor and, and the uh, city council, to uh, get $100,000 in capital improvement, which we're going to use for beefing up the infrastructure, getting new switches. And that leads again to the need for park testing, which will be all online, hopefully in 2014, we'll see. Uh, but we need to have that infrastructure in order to build our wireless network on top of that and then add Chromebooks, iPads, notebooks, things of that nature. Um, universal design and accessible technology, very important. Special needs students, uh, that's developing. It's there in certain areas at certain levels, but we have a ways to go. But it's new at this point, and we're hoping to bring more and more in. Uh, our internet and WAN access, uh, we've done a lot of things this year to change how we connect to the internet. Uh, we've brought in new kinds of uh, servers and proxy servers and we've beefed up uh, our internet connections. We had residential modems in each of the schools, which is what you have in your house. So think of a modem that you have in your house for Comcast internet is running a whole school. You can see the load that would be put on it. So at the high school, we went to business class. Uh, at JFK, we're now in business class speeds, and we'll put business class speed in all the elementary schools next year through our E-rate plan. So they're all 100 meg. So you're looking at very high speed, corporate level internet access. And we're looking at 99% uptime 
because we need that. Now we're in Google Apps for Education. Everything's going to the web. We've got to be online all the time. It's critical that we're online now. We can't afford to go down, you know, maybe for an hour or something, but for two or three days, we just can't do it now. We're too dependent. Uh, and then the last section, the action plan. The action plan is a compilation of the different things that we're looking at. Who's the owner, 2013, 14, and 2014, 2015. Those are the last two pages, um, last three pages. Uh, what we're doing is we're meeting again on a regular basis and we're fleshing this out. All of this information is available on the NPS website on the technology page, tech plan. And the tech plan is always uh, very dependent not only on the people in the school but the people in the community. So I would recommend if anyone out there is looking on the web, looking on our website, please look at our tech plan. If you have comments, concerns, questions, please let us know because it has to be a community effort. That's the way E-Rate and the Department of Ed looks at it. And so we want to be responsive to those questions that come out of the community. And so we'll be filling that in. Uh, there are objectives which are fleshed out on the second to the last page. Our infrastructure, which is, will be um, upgraded with $100,000 from the capital improvement. Uh, wireless in all school buildings if we get the next level of funding. And then laptops, Chromebooks, iPads, tablets, and so on. Bring your own device is popular. A lot of teachers feel they don't want to bring their own device because they have concerns that if it breaks in the school, who's responsible? And so there is a concern on their part. I think once we get wireless in the schools, you'll see more students bringing their devices, whether it be an iPad, a laptop, whatever because then they'll know they can use it. Uh, one thing we did do um, in the schools this year, there is wireless in every school library. So if you go into the high school library, JFK library, any elementary school library, wireless is there. So for the iPads that we do have, the laptop carts that we do have, teachers can bring their students not only to the library, but also use the wireless carts. So we're expanding a little bit of wireless just to get people into it, but we can't afford on our own to put wireless throughout the buildings. It would just be prohibitive at this point for just our budget. Uh, website has been upgraded in a number of schools. It will continue. Uh, I'll be redoing the whole website. It should be done by August. And uh, I'll save the district site for last. So all the individual schools, if you've seen high school, JFK, Bridge, Jackson Street, they're all being revamped and turned over to a new format. Um, and that's basically it. Would you have any questions? Um, I question. love it when he talks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, just a comment. I could say uh, so many of us on the committee for a long time, those of our, the long termies like us, and um, I'm sure the newbies, uh, this has been a real issue for us. We've always wanted to see a, a vision for technology, um, but not just a vision, but actually see it achieved. And um, I, I could say for the first time in a very long time, um, not only do we see a really thorough, clear vision that includes the, the wants and the needs of um, all the people, all the stakeholders in the system, but we're seeing targets hit and we're seeing um, support from the city and from the, the administration to, to make this happen in financial support and just um, moral support, everything that's needed with this. And it's a huge game changer in education. You're right, it doesn't make your job easier. Technology is... is uh, uh, it makes your job different, but and I think in some ways it makes your, in many ways it makes your job better um, because it's exciting and it's exciting for students and it's exciting for teachers and the more teachers are excited, the more students are excited and I, I'm just, I'm going to use the word excited again, but I'm very excited about what's happening with technology and uh, a lot of it goes to your credit, so thank you. Um, Mr. Meyer. When I first arrived on the school committee, I went to look for the technology plan. And I knew it, I knew the updated, there was an old one on the website, but I knew the new one had to be there because it was state law requiring that the new one be there. And then I found out that there was, in fact, no new plan. Um, so thank you for an excellent plan. 
extraordinarily clearly laid out. Thank you for your energy and skill that has been clear throughout the district this year. Um, I needed a tech question answered at 8.30 on a Friday night, and so I pulled out my phone and sent the email off to Angelo. And I had a sneaking suspicion. I was hoping this wasn't going to happen. But of course, he had his smartphone and, and answered me about seven minutes later. Um, so again, you know, it's just that level of commitment and is, is infectious. And I think it's really going to help the district move forward. Um, I'd like to reiterate um, what both Mike and Downey said. But I'd also like to say um, thank you very much for going out with and, and getting the donations from the community. I think that's wonderful. And, and I applaud both of your efforts, Brian and, and Angelo. Thank you very much. And thank you. It's a wonderful report. Very inclusive. Uh, I want to echo what everyone said, and I'll save everybody. Angelo and I could probably talk acronyms for about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, there is one question I had, though. It is acronym related. The, the Mass Broadband Initiative, the MBI, is that going to affect any of your planning, do you know, down the road? Is well, that going to be close pricing. enough? And because of E-rate, what we pay, um, if you were to get, for instance, if you went to Comcast and you say, I want uh, business class, 100 meg, it would cost you $3.99 a month. Uh, because we'll be on E-rate, we get what they call a national account, which brings it to 125, and then we get 53% off that. Mass broadband is 400 a month per school. And that's just for the broadband. Then you have to pay the carrying charges to get it there. So we're not seeing how that's going to be a savings okay. at this point. Okay. Thank you. Same on the city. We're in the same. We're going to stick with what we have because it's not. There's not a savings for us either. But it's there. Yeah, I think yeah. that'll change. But it may change. Yeah. Other. I just wanted to say how much fun it is to hear a report from somebody who clearly has passion for what they do for work. It really. Well, I mean, it's just. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's really it's really wonderful. So ditto to what everybody said, and a special public thank you for the good riddance to group was. <laughs> <laughs> Although, don't you ever go away when you're making that change? Again. That was the smartest thing you ever <laughs> or did. Anything like that, it was just I drove Tracy crazy while you were gone <laughs> trying to figure it out. Thank you for changing my phone number to the correct one. I've now received phone calls for the first time in a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> in another year. But okay. Angelo, thank you. Excellent thank you. plan. Thank you. Okay, the next item on we the agenda. both go home and get some sleep now. Yeah. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is a report of the Rules <laughs> and Policy Subcommittee. Speaking of people who love their work. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually, until I saw the agenda, I wasn't aware that this was going to be discussed this evening. It was brought to the Rules and Policy Committee a few, t uh, a couple of months ago, but then there was kind of a delay in crafting the language and getting it to us, and so I hadn't really um, paid attention that it was coming to us. And I do have some concerns. Um, there are there are a few changes that are highlighted in the document, and the rationale is sort of listed off to the side in a track changes thing. But if we actually do change our transportation as as it was proposed, this policy is incorrect and needs additional changes. It says in there that bus passes will be issued for K-12. Oh. And. Um, it says that secondary students in grades 7 through 12 will have to purchase. Pro so there are a number of items in here that need to be revised if the changes to transportation stick. If it's reinstated, then we just need to look at them and determine if they're correct yeah. the way they are. Reinstated will be correct. If it's not, then you're right. We'll have to change it. I didn't think of that. Sorry. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> More. I had a couple of things also that I thought should be addressed in here um, that weren't, you know. Um, one has to do with the uh, code of conduct reference, the bus discipline thing. Um, compare it to the code of conduct in the student handbooks, and there are some discrepancies. So um, it would be really good. No, you, because you the tell me code of section? conduct in the student handbooks has bus has a section for for bus violations, but the penalties are different than the ones in this policy. So so that would need to be aligned. I can tell you which can you tell me where chosen, but it would need to be aligned. Um, and 
um, likewise, and, and then some other things that aren't addressed that are in our code of conduct, so it's just bullying policy, um, which is not mentioned in the transportation policy. Um, so whether we just simply want to eliminate that and just refer to the code of conduct, which be. might not entirely cover it, though, because a lot of the code of conduct doesn't deal with a penalty including not being allowed to ride on the bus because the code of conduct is mostly focused on school and so its penalties involve participation in at the school building as opposed to on the bus. So, th so there's a certain amount of work to be done between that and the whole code of conduct part. Um, also, um, there were some curious differences in the numbers. Um, in section D of our bus policy here, we listed in terms of capacities of buses, D7, I think, it said that our capacity was 60 on a 71, but in another section it said our capacity was 51 on a 77. Um, <laughs> so in other words, there's just there's some numbers that are just not in sync within the policy itself, like from one section to the next. Actually, those were just updated by Joy Winnie to match the state, the complaint. Right, but then there's down in another section, there's a, another set that's got the 60, so not so in it section didn't six. Get carried forward. No, in section D seven. It just it there's, there was one that was so it, it sixty didn't get on a, forward. sixty on a seventy one as opposed to the fifty one on a seventy seven. It, it it just it's just confusing numbers in other words. All right, I'll re I'll ask her to look at that again. <laughs> um, and then the final one is something that I don't know what our bus policy was back when I um, ten years ago, but we used to be able to uh, have our kids go home when we weren't going to be home to meet them off the bus on an occasional basis, have them go get off at a different stop at a friend's house and be picked up by that friend's parent. And we could do that with a note. And I know it, notice, I don't know whether the policy got changed to eliminate that option or whether this policy was the one that was in existence and this was an off the books program, but it was incredibly helpful to us as parents to not because when that policy did change a few years ago, it became very difficult. We had numbers of times when, you know, we were at work, and it was, and we, while well, normally we could arrange our schedule so that one of us could be there at 3:15 or 3:20, you know, sometimes it happens where that's not possible, and we could write a note, send it with our child, we gave it to the teacher, and our kid would get off at Lisa's house, and, you know, we made the phone calls and things. It wasn't a surprise. But it was really, really useful and tremendous service to us at, I think, no cost whatsoever to the district. And, um, to, and I would like to have that be included in this policy. I would like us to be able to do that. The transportation director was pretty clear about not allowing any, I mean, there, there, we, discussed, there we discussed whether it's possible that you could go to after school care three days a week and home the other two days a week and we just there there it's just it's difficult to keep up with little children and we have uh, some liability concerns about making sure that people get where they're supposed to get so i think from her perspective it's easier to just say these the rules are the rules and this is the I way i understand we do. that but so i understand while we were doing request, this I'll the bring only it to time i heard day. about it was actually where a child got off at their, at the, where they were supposed to get off and there was nobody there to greet them. I never heard during you know, my six years of being in that world, heard anybody say that their child had, I mean, because the reason this works is because you've contacted the other parent and they've can said, we, yes, I will meet your child. Could we send this back to the subcommittee or something and have you discuss it with them? Or? That's what I'm hoping. It certainly do. So it sounds like you this needs a little more. I think it needs some. More. I think it needs some more work, and I think we need to determine whether we are actually changing the <coughs> transportation services that we offer okay. before yeah. we can. Okay. We we may bring it back to you with changes to le, to the rest of the language if we don't know about our transportation offerings for this year. But hopefully we can get that figured out and just bring you the whole thing revised in a couple of months. So the agenda had set a first reading tonight, so obviously would you like a... <laughs> it would have come back anyway next month, but I think, I don't know when we would schedule another uh, rules and policy meeting, so I would say maybe not for June, but maybe it'll be back in July. Okay. 
So um, I guess I don't know. Would that constitute then a first reading again? If we change it a lot? Yeah, I, I don't think we've, yeah, I'm not sure if we could count tonight as a first reading, okay. so um, so we can bring it back in July. Do you require a vote to send it back to you, or are we just, no, we'll no. just continue this I, and, I okay, so. fine. <clears throat> okay, so now um, uh, we will turn to, I believe the superintendent will be providing the business manager report. Well, our business manager is in a three-day course, uh, continuing his work to get his procurement license. And so um, he has his exam in the morning, and I offered to give the report for him. Uh, so you have it in your packet. Just a couple of the noteworthy items that the FY14 budget was approved, and that um, with the mayor's proposal of a Prop 2.5 override, the administrative team continues to draft our list of priorities. And as I said earlier, that should be complete by the end of next week. And we'll pass that on to the mayor. That should become public uh, shortly after that. Um, also, I think it's important to note that the district has advertised and posted for the new bus contract. And uh, you know this is a very big deal. Uh, so there will be bid opening. Um, it should all be complete by the end of the month. Uh, you may be wondering, what if we change the bus services? And so we have put the bid out as our budget is approved right now, because that's what we know for sure. And in the event that the override passes and we bring busing back to the high school, then we can do an addendum to the contract. Um, but we certainly can't wait uh, to do our bus bid until that happens. So I wanted you to know that. Another uh, important highlight here is that the student information system, once again, yay Angelo, uh, has been, uh, he's bringing our new student information system, the Aspen X2, uh, to our school system. We had to go out to bid and uh, this was a big purchase once again that uh, the mayor and the city is helping us with and uh, with through capital planning. <laughs> <laughs> be specific. <laughs> uh, and the technology department will be installing this new software, training the teachers and training, more importantly, the administrative assistants to help us do this. Uh, we decided to do it in the spring so that everybody's trained for September rather than to put it in the summer and try to train people as the school year is starting. And so uh, Angelo, I can't say enough about him, he takes on big projects, large initiative. He seems to be tireless in his efforts and continues to move us forward. Uh, the FY14 capital plan, um, you know, we went off, um, how do I say it, um, off timeline with the new charter. So what we did in the fall for uh, capital planning, we now are doing again in the spring under the new charter for capital planning for next year and again we are we have a request in for two hundred thousand dollars for our technology so we can finish the implementation of what we need to do for park testing and also um, twenty five thousand dollars to help support the aspen x2 and we will wait to hear on that that's it for the highlights of the business <coughs> manager report you also have the printout in front of you of our current budget um, i'll just lead you to the bottom line uh, as you can see, we are in May. We have two months, 60 days left to go in our fiscal year, and we have used 75% of our budget. Um, that could be very exciting. However, I want to caution you that at the end of June, our expenses are at their greatest point, so it's not evenly distributed throughout the 12 months because of the summer payment for teachers, and also some of our special ed tuition bills will come in in May and June. However, in analyzing the numbers and the bills, our best projection is that we are in very good shape to close the end of the year um, with a zero net balance. And, uh, well, actually, I guess I should pause and see if there's any questions or comments on the business manager report. All right, and we'll move on to the personnel report, which once uh, again, uh, very short, self-explanatory, I'm not sure there's would be any questions there? And then the superintendent report. So as you know, uh, Sarah Madden will be joining us as the Ryan Road principal, and I'm very confident that we've made the right match uh, with the principal and the talent and the experience and such a caring leader. Uh, the site visit was fantastic, and we heard all the, all the right things we 
knew we would hear in confirming her appointment at Ryan Road. Uh, the high school search continues as of this afternoon. They handed three finalists to me. I met with the committee. Uh, it was chaired by Lori Farkas, the first round selection committee. We started with 55 applicants. Um, they selected eight for interviews, one backed out. So I believe, uh, so, um, I believe they interviewed a total of seven. They gave me four, I'm sorry, three finalists, and we will have the second round process next week. Our finalists are uh, Brian Lombardi, as the associate principal at the high school right now. He's been there for six years, and prior to that, he had five years as associate principal of Minichog, and before that, he was a school adjustment counselor. We have a candidate, Greg Brigenti. He is from New Hampshire. He has spent the past 11 years as an administrator in Pembroke Academy. Pembroke, New Hampshire. Uh, I believe 11 years, so nine years were as assistant principal. In the past two years, he's been the director of curriculum and instruction. And prior to that, he spent seven years as a chemistry teacher in Concord, New Hampshire. And our third candidate is Kevin LaLime, and he is currently in Springfield. He's spent the last four years as assistant principal at Springfield Central High School. He has also served as the dean of students and a social studies teacher. So I'm very excited that the three high quality candidates and the process will continue next week Thursday with um, site visit the following week and appointment after that. For the second round interviews, we have a series of forums. The candidates will have a tour of the school, will meet with the faculty after school, will meet with a group of students, the parents and community members will be invited and they'll also do a, a formal interview uh, with me and I'd like to have a committee of uh, a total of six. So if possible, I'm inviting three school committee members to join me next Thursday and you would have to be available from one to four. Um, you have to be available the whole time because it's not fair to come and see one candidate and not see the others. Uh, very difficult to vote. I buried that deep, but I believe it is one to four. Uh, and if you're interested, please email me or you can let me know tonight and I'll get the, the times to you. Leeds first round interviews uh, for their principal uh, will finish on Friday and then they'll give three finalists, two or three finalists to me and I'll set up the um, second round interviews for that candidate next week. Johanna McKenna has been uh, chairing that first round committee and uh, these chairs put in a lot of time a lot of energy and I really appreciate the structure and the professionalism they're bringing to this hiring process. I do want to take a moment to stop and just acknowledge and uh, acknowledge the loss of our boys swim coach uh, Steve Constantine just to honor the work that he's done with our kids. Um, he passed away last week and though I didn't have a chance to know him those who knew him have spoken so highly of him and his care for the sport and his care for the kids and uh, we're sorry to have lost him. Next Wednesday, as Blue Duvall mentioned, um, on Wednesday, May 15th from 6 to 8, JFK Middle School Cafeteria is a school connectedness and teen wellness. And I just also want to make sure that I invite all the school committee members. I really love to see um, some of you there. Uh, for that evening, it's very important for the Prevention Coalition. Uh, last time they had an evening, they had a lot of support. They do provide dinner. Last time they completely ran out of food and had to order extra pizzas, so they're ordering <laughs> double and triple this time. And they've uh, assured us that if, even if all of you come, we won't run out of food. So if, you, if you're available, we'd love to see you there. You're doing introductory remarks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're on the agenda. Uh, Tuesday was Teacher Appreciation Day and Wednesday was School Nurse Appreciation Day and I just also want to thank our PTOs who generously supported the faculty throughout the week and made them feel very special and appreciated. Today as Principal Nancy Athis mentioned was a Special Olympics for Western Mass at the high school and uh, she did point out what I'm sorry I have to repeat. There is a student at Leeds. His name is A.J. Strack this fourth grade student who has an incredibly special musical talent. Um, he went out there to sing the national anthem and so when you see a fourth grader go to sing the national anthem you are prepared to be polite and applaud and encourage. He hit the first note, tears in my eyes. He continued on, tears rolled down my face, I'm choked up, I look at Nancy after she's crying next <laughs> to me and I say to her, 
I have to talk after he finishes. <laughs> His voice is golden. I've never heard anything like that. And uh, it doesn't go unrecognized. His family's very supportive of his musical talent, and he is going to a summer music camp for people with unique musical talents. Um, so if you know him, or if you ever have a chance to hear him, uh, you're going to hear that name again, I promise you. And also, thank you to the students, the parents, and all the volunteers that made the Special Olympics event so special today. For the highlights, uh, you received math assignments, and I'm not going to go through these, uh, except to mention that sometimes when we think about school and the academic challenge in our classrooms, we tend to think about our experiences and remember our experiences. And it's important to note that for some of us, our experience in elementary math was at least 40 or more years ago. Right? And uh, when you look at what the kids are doing now, it's very different from what we did, but it's about mathematical ideas. It's not about solving an equation. And so as you can see from the very first one from Bridge Street, you look at these equations, is it true, and figure out why, what's the relationship between the numbers, and what are other ways to do this to make the equ equation true. This is coming from second, third, and fourth grade students. And so I hope you were able to do the first couple pages. <laughs> and uh, you can see the progression and the thinking that these kids go through from elementary school through middle school to the high school, which maybe you weren't able to do those high school problems. <laughs> but I wanted you to take a look at it. I think it's very special what our kids do in school and what our teachers are able to lead them through. And so I will post these problems on the website uh, under the highlights on the blog so that parents can see a sample of the problems too. So I hope you enjoyed your math homework. Finally, I want to just comment on the override draft. I've mentioned that it's in process. I want to give you some general idea without giving you specifics uh, until final decisions are made. We are going to uh, currently talking about restoring busing. We're talking about restoring positions. And uh, with the amount of money that would be given to us, there's not enough to restore all of the positions. So I don't want that to be misunderstood that everything that was cut is coming back. That's not true. Um, we're bringing much of it back and proposing to bring much of it back. We're also adding some new programs and new positions that we feel are essential. One of them in particular is around our students who are English language learners and we need to um, improve and increase that staffing to be in compliance with the regulations for the state. So you'll see some of that on this priority list. We definitely are planning to restore budgets for classroom supplies at all levels. Uh, There's a desperate need for that. And if there's new money available, that's one of our priorities. It's also important we plan to build in a, a personnel reserve so that these services can be sustained over two, three, and maybe four years because we don't want to bring things back in next year, have you sitting here cutting things again. So we're going to be forward thinking in our planning and I want you to be prepared to see that when, when we bring that forward. And finally, the much talked about custodial position at the um, JFK on weekends to support the Park and Rec program is very important to me. It's very important to our team. And we cannot justify putting it in our budget. But we uh, have met with Anne Marie. I've talked with the mayor. We want to support that position being there so these programs can continue to be offered to our families. And so we would like to offer a small portion of our budget if the override passes to central services so they can pay for the custodian and support those programs. I don't think it's appropriate to be in the school budget, but we also don't want to cut it out either. So uh, you'll have the official plan shortly, and that concludes my report tonight. Thank you. Um, are there any uh, new business items? That, um, Questions? Uh, sure. Sure. Uh, um, I have a question. Given that we, um, that if the override money comes through, that there, are go I am assuming that there are going to be some of the programming that's currently on the table at the high school would be back on. Yes. How, how is it that? Uh, it was mentioned that you know the kids have already registered for classes for next year. So right now they're registering for classes with, with lots of cuts that may be coming back. How did, what will happen over the summer for kids? How, how is that going to all play out? That's a good question and an important one. And I'm pleased to say that I was a high school principal and can answer that with some insight. Uh, we have to schedule the students before the end of the year. And we have to schedule them with what we know and what we have. Uh, it's far easier to do this and then make changes 
than it is to wait and then try to do the scheduling after the end of June. So we're putting kids, uh, they're registering for classes, the classes we know we're going to have and we can support. Um, in, in light of the override, if that passes and we can restore some of these electives, guidance counselors and administrators will be working over the summer to put those back in. And that's, uh, that's a rather easy thing to do at that point because we already know what kids' first choices are and we're, you know, if their first choice is a class we're not offering, they're going to their second choice, and we can simply call them at home, call the parents and say, do you want to go back to your first choice? Usually they say yes and we can redo the schedule. So does that mean that when they registered <coughs> that their list of choices were um, included things that are not available? So that their first choice might have been a class that isn't actually currently offered? Well, again, the program of studies uh, and the course selection guide is created in January and February when we didn't know which classes were being cut. So they were able to select those courses, then the courses were cut, so now we have to schedule them without those and we can put it back in the summer. Okay, thank you. Mr. Moore. Yeah, I'd be interested and curious to find out sort of what the thinking is on restoring the busing. I, it seems if, we, if, we, if we, when we voted on this other budget, we were essentially saying that we thought that um, we would rather eliminate the busing than eliminate an additional what, one and a half FTEs or something like that? Um, it, it seems like we're so close, as you say, we aren't going to be able to restore essentially everything back to where it was normally. Are we saying that the, that it was, I mean, which, I guess I'm curious to know, once the decision is made that busing to the high school isn't worth the one and a half FTEs, um, which it wasn't then, so a month ago, if the override passes, how is it that busing to the high school becomes worth one and a half FTEs when we still are, don't have enough teachers in the classroom, even with the, I, I just don't understand the, how it changes its value so quickly. Uh, well, I'd like to clarify that it didn't change its value. Anything we put on the cut list, we didn't want to put on well, the I cut list. I understand that. Everything was really valuable to us. And I'll tell you how this conversation went when I went to the alt meeting and I said let's start our priority list. Uh, if it wasn't the first, it was the second thing that the administrator said we have to put that busing back on because they, our commitment to kids and to the respect for human differences to the families that depend on busing is, um, is something we hold in high, high value and so our administrators, there's no doubt in their mind that that was one of the first things they wanted back on there is getting the kids to school. Why didn't we in our original budget just go ahead and cut another one and a half FTEs and leave the busing in then if it's that high of a value? Um, I can't answer that, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, bringing back or putting money towards the, um, the position of, at uh, the weekend position at um, the rec department, we were just putting out a contract tonight for $8,115 for mechanical repair of the pool. I mean, we are still paying for that program. So, and I do think it's important, and I would like to see it stay open, but we're already paying for it, and I don't know how much more well, you're talking about. Well, the school does use the pool. I just, I always right, like, to, so remind they. I, I I know just they like to remind people that there's physical classes. They do, classes. and that's why I'm not saying anything yeah. about it, but I'm just okay. saying as far as the extra yeah. that we're actually paying for a custodian that we don't necessarily have to pay for. Yes, we would have to pay for the pool. Whether it would break down as quickly if we didn't have so many people in it, you know, and wasn't so used, I don't know. I'm not suggesting and haven't suggested going after them for the mechanical upkeep and all of those other expenses and the electrical. I'm just concerned about where the priorities are as far as putting in a half-time teacher or ELL, whatever we put in, as opposed to the janitor over there, the custodian over there. And so that's just my concern is that, because we already have, I mean, we already pay a lot towards the pool, whether they recognize it or not, just in the maintenance. They don't have to pay the maintenance. Uh, so, um, I don't know, I just urge to reconsider the, Putting money in, but I don't know how much you want to do for, for the um, custodian. Well, but I don't. I'm sorry. With all due respect, I don't think we should spend time yeah. talking about the priority list that doesn't exist yet. Okay. So let us finish it and bring it to you, and then we should have this discussion right. when it's on Thank the you. table. Yep. Okay. Are there any other uh, 
comments about the superintendent's report. Okay, any new business? Uh, and then the only other item would be to remind folks that we do have a special uh, school committee meeting scheduled for May 14th at 5 p.m. here at JFK. This will be primarily to talk about the superintendent's search with the representative from NESDEC. And then, of course, we have our regular school committee meeting on June 13th. And now I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? Uh. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>